Paying the Power Bill, Walking in the Anointing, a book written by Apostle Goodhart Obi Akweme, narrated and produced by Onimisi Adaba for 123 Communications Limited. Introduction Beloved, the journey of life is far from a smooth and simple equation. It is a more simplistic approach to assume and expect a life without the interjections of twists, turns and bumps along the way. How I wish I could, as a man of God, or a great prophet as some have described me, declare to you and promise that life would be very simple, that there will be no twists and turns along the way. But even if I attempted to tell you that, you would already be experienced enough to know that life is simply not that smooth a journey. Many who have been presumptuous about life being a smooth sail without any obstacles have come to great disappointments at the outcomes that life has brought them. Truly, experience will tell anyone living today that nobody is exempt from the challenges that come with normal life on earth. Certain things you are going through today are simply part of normal living. Somebody elsewhere has faced the same thing you are facing right now in his past. Another person is about to go through what you have come out of. And yet, another precious soul is also battling the same trials as you are today. Contrary to many religious teachings, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't exclude or exempt us from tests and trials. It doesn't preclude from our lives the vagaries of normal human experience. What Christianity guarantees you and me, however, is that we will have the resilience, the courage, the staying power to fight our battles, and ultimately, God will give us the victory. In other words, God doesn't guarantee there will be no battles, but He does assure us that He is always on our side to give us victory at the end of the day. The burdens the Lord allows us to bear are to broaden our shoulders and not to break our backs. The Bible makes us understand that as believers who are born again by the Spirit and the Word of God, we are born to win. If you and I were born to win, it means that there are certain tests that we will pass through of necessity, but ultimately we will win. We have the guarantee of heaven that we are more than conquerors in every challenge we face. For you to be declared a winner, there must be challenges you confront and conquer. Because you are destined a winner, you've got to be prepared to be a fighter. For without being willing to go into battle, you are not yet ready for victory. The effort in the reading of this book is to present you hands-on tested principles that will work you into spiritual platforms that guarantee victory over all tests of life. Truth be told, you have what it takes to win. Contained in this book is how to engage and release that power. Enjoy. Every child of the living God ought to carry a victor mentality, not a victim mentality. When you fight battles, Something ought to rise within you, telling you, this too shall pass. That situation will not last forever. It shall come to pass. Chapter 1 You can handle it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. The word Christ is not the surname of Jesus. We used to think it was his surname or second name. But that word Christ speaks of the anointed and his anointing. So Paul, under the unction of the Spirit of God, says, I can do all things through the anointed and his anointing, which strengthens me. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I particularly like the word overcome. The same word is used several other times in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Holy Bible. There, God calls believers who triumph through their earthly journeys overcomers. So your title in the Holy Bible is Overcomer. You are born to win. You are born to be a victor. You are born to enjoy triumphs. It must be stressed that for you to overcome, there will be obstacles and challenges. To overcome actually is to come over a barrier. I am intentionally stirring your heart not to be afraid of tests and trials, no matter their structure and magnitude. Many times, if not all times, those tests are opportunities for God to add crowns upon your head. Thank God we have begun to recognize now that when God allows us to go through certain fights, we are coming out with some trophies after all is said and done. Many believers dodge the battle, but in so doing, 
they also miss the crown of victory waiting at the end of the battle. Even as you listen to the reading of this book, if you look back into your history and are very sincere with yourself, you will see that there were certain things the devil brought your way to destabilize you and in those moments of trial and testing, you thought life had come to an end. You thought there would be no tomorrow. You thought, where is God in all of these? But today, having come out of those trials into triumphs, having come through the tests into testimonies, having come past the obstacles into your miracles, you look back and say, Father Lord, thank you for bringing me through what I went through. Because truth be told, some of those victories made you a better person than you were before you went into battle. Victories make you better than what you were before you went into battle. Let me tell you about myself. There was a young girl I dated many, many years ago for about six years. I thought I was going to marry this young girl, but at the critical moment, she threw a javelin into my heart. You might call it 9 inch or 11 inch, but it felt like a 100 inch javelin right in my heart. I was in emotional tatters, broken. It seemed beyond repair. I didn't know that I could ever recuperate, but God told me something. If it didn't work, my son, it means it wasn't meant to be. I have something better for you. And within months, I met my queen, my Oshobo princess, the love of my life. Today, having been married to this precious lady for more than two decades, I look back and thank God for that painful incident which God turned around for a testimony. For through that first relationship, I learned how to treat a lady. So it made me a better man for my wife. The Bible makes us understand that if the prince of this world had known, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Look back into your history and say bye-bye to a trial of yesterday turned into a testimony. Do you remember when your boss gave you the left leg of fellowship and kicked you out of that job and you wondered how you would feed yourself and your family? But within months, God brought you into a better job and now you are thankful to your former boss for acting out the mind of God? You know that if he had not kicked you out, you would have stayed there and died as a janitor, disgusted, living in Egypt when you could have come into Canaan. Thank God for your enemies those that hated you. Thank God for them. Joseph, for instance, would thank God for his brothers who hated him. The hatred of his brothers ushered Joseph into the palace. Thank God for your enemies who disliked and despised you because they have become stepping stones to your favorable position today. No matter the kind of challenges or trials you ever face in life as a child of God, something ought to rise up within you that says courageously, I can handle this. You may not believe you can handle it and so you are waiting for your pastor or your boss. No, you can handle it. You were born to tackle and overcome this situation simply because the greater one, Christus, lives and resides within you. Every child of the living God ought to carry a victory mentality, not a victim mentality. When you fight battles, something ought to rise within you telling you, this too shall pass. That situation will not last forever. It shall come to pass. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it reads, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. This verse reveals a principle, that God will not allow any difficulty, challenge or trial to come the way of an individual or group of individuals that is greater than what God has wired them to be able to handle. See that test as a window of opportunity and experience the testimony that comes after the test. God says through the Apostle Paul that he will with the temptation also make a way of escape. If you're facing a season that seems like a sequence of trauma after trauma, God is saying, my son or my daughter, you can handle it. There is something on your inside capable of rising up to confront the issues that confront you. It may seem so difficult and unbearable. It may appear that you can't cope anymore. But the devil is a liar. You have been designed by God to be able to handle this. Your God is El Elyon, the Most High God. He is El Shaddai, the Many-Breasted God, the Best of All. He lives in you. By His help, let the warrior king or queen within you rise up to do battle. Every test is a window of opportunity opened for you to experience a testimony. Life may not give you what you desire or even deserve by certain standards. Life gives you what you are willing to fight for. 
We often have good desires, but no results. We think, I deserve to be blessed, but it looks like a pipe dream. That's because life doesn't give you what you desire or think you deserve, but what you are willing to fight for. Before victory will ever arrive at the doorstep of any man or woman, there must be a season of battle and contention. What you are not willing to resist will simply remain in your life. What you are not willing to confront, you will not be able to conquer. What you allow and watch will certainly remain the same. Life may not respond to what you desire, but it will life may not respond to what you desire, but it will bow to what you really demand. Beloved, it is time for you to rise up and fight. If you got into a boxing ring with God on your side, you are assured of victory. It is a joy to know that God is both your coach and the referee. He won't allow the whistle to be blown when the enemy has your back against the wall. You might have fallen a couple of times, but you are not out. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, it reads, For a just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again. Don't give up on yourself, no matter how many times you've tried and fallen. The fight will end in your favor. You must believe in God and in yourself. The Bible declares in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, All things are possible to him that believeth. When your faith is in place, things that were previously only possible with God become also possible with you because you have teamed up with Him. I have you in my prayers as I put down these God-inspired thoughts. Your problems are prospects and your obstacles are the raw materials for your miracles. Every test you are facing now will end in testimonies. Those everlasting mountains are about to be removed and every perpetual hill is being shifted. Before you are done listening to the reading of this book, the Holy Ghost would have done a quick work in your favor. Get ready for your breakthrough. That trial is not stopping you or regulating your praise. Don't let situations change the way you dance. You may be hungry, but there is fullness of joy. With God on your side, you can handle it. Chapter 2 The Clash of Kingdoms Child of God, there is a clash of kingdoms upon the face of the earth and whether unfortunately or fortunately, we as believers are right in the middle of this clash. There is a direct confrontation between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. There's a real devil on campaign and he's not exactly excited about your status and position as a child of the living God. He vehemently opposes your success precisely because you are a child of God. The devil is called the adversary, the accuser of the brethren, before the throne of God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it reads, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Also in Revelation chapter 12 verse 10, it reads, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. It means your enemy is not the witch doctor in your village. It is not your mama or your papa that doesn't like you. Not your uncle, not your neighbor, and not your colleague in the office. Your adversary is the devil. He may use people as smoke screens, but your real enemy is the devil. The word adversary means 1. A person, group or force that opposes or attacks opponents. 2. A person, group or force that is an opponent in a contest. What better way than those to describe Satan and his ministry against the saints? In John chapter 10 verse 10, it reads, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and kill and destroy. I am come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Please, know your real enemy. Satan is the one you are to direct your focus to. He is the one to confront and to conquer. His threefold mandate is to steal, kill and destroy. Some people think that the people who are being used as vessels or vehicles to bring changes to them are the enemy. But the enemy is the person behind the scenes and you must unmask him or you keep fighting shadows or merely dealing with leaves and branches of the matter. You are dealing with symptoms, but you haven't gone deep down to deal with the root cause of the situation. 
you need to deal with the root of the challenges and tests you've been going through to effectively handle them. In Matthew chapter 11 verse 12 it reads, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. If you want victory, you have to be willing of necessity to be violent to take it by force. You have to come to the place where you declare to yourself, enough is enough. You don't need your spouse, friend or family to tell you. You've got to come to that point where you are tired of being tired, tired of skirting the same mountain, seeing the same images, telling the same story, rehashing the sweet testimony of seven years ago with no current news. Until you come to the place where you are restless within you for a change, change is not about to come. I perceive that you have come to a place of restlessness. The baby in your womb is not just seven months old. It is now eight months and two weeks old. The baby has been kicking. You know that there is much more to life than you have experienced. You know that of all that God has spoken to you by way of prophecy, you haven't even begun to scratch the surface. You know there is much more to your life and destiny than meets the eye. You know on your inside you are loaded. You are anointed. You see yourself making waves. You know there is much more to you than is apparent and you yearn for the outward expression of your inward impression. And you're right, because you are just at the verge of your manifestation. Have you seen a pregnant woman about to deliver? She becomes very irritable. She begins to pick up unnecessary fights with her husband. Now, all that fight is not because she's a person that lacks character. No, there's something bothering her in her womb that wants to be delivered. I have seen my sons and daughters display the same spirit of positive restlessness and when they paint the vision, they talk with me and I see the vision is usually huge. But I have made it my mission to encourage them because we have a big God as our father. One of my sons once showed up in my house saying he wanted to run for the Federal House of Representatives. I looked at him and thought, this boy, are you sure you know what you want to run for? Do you mean the House of Assembly in your state or the Federal House of Representatives? I could see that he didn't have the necessary qualifications or connections, no godfather anywhere, no money in his bank account. But I saw that his vision was bigger than him, and I realized that only God can bring this to pass. I instantly felt a pull in my spirit to release grace upon him. So I said, Son, kneel down. I lay my hands upon you as one of the chosen ones. Go forward and be a spark, the first fruit of those who were grown in the house of God to occupy a place in government. Not imported senators or governors, but those we saw God groom before our very eyes from carrying chairs around to working in the National Assembly. My son, go, I anoint you for the assignment. It's okay to get restless within you. There's an unrest that opens the door to true rest. You know your job is too small. You know the anointing upon your house is too small. Get ready. Extend your tent, for something is about to happen. I can't explain it. I can't articulate it. But in your life, I know that something is about to happen. Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 to 2 reads, Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. You have to take this season of your life very seriously. God is going to separate the sheep from the goats. You can't afford to maintain double standards in your service to the Lord. If the Lord be God, let us all serve him. In the coming season, there will be no room for dilly-dallying when it comes to the things of God. You are either hot or cold, you are either in or out. There is no room for being half godly and half worldly. Heaven has held out its tape rule, and as heaven measures the season, you have to shake off lethargy and do all that God requires to take your spiritual walk to the next level. Love the word and be a person of great prayer. Have fellowship with your fellow sheep. Each time you come into the gathering of saints, you receive strength to go out again. Don't stay back and be a Sunday believer. Be a believer every day of your life. Why? God is measuring. God is ruling and God is rewarding. In Romans chapter 8 verses 37 to 39 it reads, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth 
nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can you think about that is not in all? In all these things, we are more than conquerors. I want you for just a minute to think of the most difficult situation in your life and remember the word all. Think about the most tempestuous situations in your life and include it in all. In all these things, you are more than conquerors through him that loved you. The verdict of God in every battle you face is that you are more than a conqueror. In other words, even if you think you can't handle it, God has already declared you ahead of time to be more than a conqueror. The scripture paints a picture that as a child of the living God, you cannot be stopped. You were born unstoppable. But you have to come to this conviction that God has already pre-cut you. That means before you were created, God cut you. You were pre-shaped for your position in life. You were pre-cut to fight the battles you are fighting and to gain the victories God has for you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it reads, They had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Learn to commonize challenges. Don't consider any situation as strange or special. Commonize every test or challenge, knowing full well that ultimately they will turn for a testimony for you. Luke chapter 21 verse 13 reads, And it shall turn to you for a testimony. The battle you're going through right now is going to turn to you for a testimony. That challenge, that difficulty that seems unending is going to turn for you a testimony. It is about to turn, like the baby in the womb of the mother turns just before delivery. Before today, they were called obstacles, but from today, they have become miracles. I perceive that what God will do for you will be in the order of Psalm 126, which reads, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord had done great things for them. The Lord had done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. This is from Psalm 126 verses 1 to 4. Apostle Paul in the midst of his challenges declared in the face of it all, None of these things move me. This is in Acts chapter 20 verse 24. Child of God, it is complimentary for God to allow you go through particular pathways of difficulty in life. The things that have tested and tried you in certain ways are actually God's way of approving you. He knows that you can handle them. I've been alive for about five decades and those years haven't been altogether fine, dandy and lovely. There have been dark and bleak moments wherein I lacked food to eat, clothes to wear and was forsaken and forgotten by many. But God knew that I could handle them all. Heaven paid me compliments and thank God I didn't disappoint heaven. You too can handle it. You were born for this. The test is not taking you out. The trial is not stopping you or regulating your praise. Don't let situations change the way you dance. You may be hungry, but there is fullness of joy. With God on your side, you can handle it. Don't get lost with your losses. One of the common denominators we find along the way as we make advancement to fulfill our God-ordained purposes is the likelihood that we suffer some losses. A faith fanatic may think this sounds like unbelief, but I'll be real and scriptural here. We all suffer some sort of losses, from Abraham to Isaac, and from Joseph to Paul the Apostle. The losses could be minor or major, trivial or significant, but all of us have at some point or the other, along life's journey, lost things we treasured. Sincerely, I have suffered losses too. One of such is what I shared in Chapter 1 of the lady I dated for about six years who walked out on me. I felt like I lost my world. If you take a very careful look at the 15th chapter of Luke, you will find out this chapter in its entirety deals with the subject matter of losses in life. The chapter documents three parables that dealt with something in particular that was lost. 1. The Lost Sheep Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you? 
having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he had found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. This is in Luke chapter 15 verses 1 to 7. In this parable of the lost sheep, the sheep was lost involuntarily, not intentionally. One out of a hundred strayed sheep from the sheepfold. There are losses we have experienced that were not in any way intentional or deliberate. In other words, we didn't plan or desire for the loss to happen. We can say it just happened. There are certain things you have lost in your life and you can't exactly say I am to blame or I am responsible for it. Somehow these things just happen and we have to move on. 2. The Lost Coin Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. This is from Luke chapter 15 verses 8 to 10. In this parable of the lost coin, the coin was lost out of carelessness. The Bible says the woman had ten pieces of silver and lost one. It didn't walk away of its own accord. It was the result of her carelessness. She was responsible. She lost one piece. Simply put, she was responsible for the missing coin. When you consider your own life, you find that there are things you lost along the way as a result of your own carelessness and wrong decisions. 3. The Lost Son And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And when he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. This is in Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 23. The case of the lost son is the story of a father who had two sons. The younger son decided one day to leave with his inheritance and squandered it. At the return of the son, the father said, For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry, as recorded in Luke chapter 15 verses 24 to 32. There are losses you have experienced in your life and you know you allowed yourself to walk into them, not ignorantly and not by mistake or by happenstance. You knew full well the consequences of what you were about to do. Young ladies, for example, know when they are about to have that one night stand that they could get pregnant. No lady sleeps and just wakes up pregnant. The girl who conceived an unwanted pregnancy knew exactly what she was doing and did it. She wanted what resulted in the unwanted. The beautiful thing about the 15th chapter of Luke is that everything that got lost was ultimately found, recovered and restored. The sheep that was lost involuntarily was eventually found. 
The coin that was lost out of carelessness was recovered and the son who got lost voluntarily was restored. The moral of the whole story is that whatever is lost in your life, no matter how, no matter where, no matter when it was lost in the first place, is going to be found, recovered and restored. Whatever you lost, you will get it all back because the thief is not a man or woman but the devil himself and Jesus has come to restore abundantly. There is recovery for everything you ever lost, no matter who or what was responsible for it. It could be your money or your honey, that's marriage. It could be your business or your health that is ailing and failing. Whatever it is, there is going to be a turnaround. There is recovery for you. In Joel chapter 2 verses 25 to 27 it reads, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and no one else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Understand this. When it's time for divine recovery, there is nothing the devil can do about it. When someone steals a thing from you and you go to a court of law, if your legal counsel knows his onions, he will stand bold and recover what was stolen. The devil is a thief. He will repay what he has stolen. And not only that, he will pay for damages. We call this divine justice. Too many times we let the devil get off the hook, but not this time. No, devil, you won't only pay for what you have stolen, you will also pay for more. You will pay for damages and have your resources depleted by the saints of God as we recover all you have stolen. Enough is enough. Beloved, this is a good place to pause and pray. Don't let this moment pass, for your heart has just been prepared for recovery. Pray now. One mistake we make as believers is thinking that the moment we were baptized with the Holy Ghost, it was all we needed for the rest of our lives. But no, we need to keep going back for refilling again and again in order to stay full and fresh. Chapter 3 Where are the Elijahs of God? In 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 to 24 and 30 to 39, it reads, so Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are four hundred and fifty men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and call ye on the name of your gods, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, 
that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Elijah was one of the great prophets of old and he had an amazing and most impactful ministry. Prophet Elijah, like many other such prophets in the Holy Bible, burst into the scene of the history of Israel to serve as a deliverer and a catalyst of revival over a nation that had gone into spiritual stupor, what we know in theological interpretations as apostasy. Apostasy is a season in the life of a people of God in which they no longer serve God but have begun to serve idols of different sorts. In the history of Israel, from time to time, when they veered off the path of obedience, from walking the straight and narrow way of God's commands, the results were captivity, destruction and suffering. They became prey to enemies God had designed for them to rule over. In other words, their servants became their lords and masters because they left the right path. In our time and age, suffering, diseases, hunger and servitude are prevalent due to the ungodliness and wickedness of men. To the spiritually sensitive, the cry for deliverance rents the air across the nations. In Obadiah verse 21, it reads, And Saviour shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Deliverers Wanted Hosea chapter 12 verse 13 reads, And by a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. History is replete with incidences in which God typically made ways to bring deliverances to his people. He will raise up a man who would be a prophet or someone else depending on the mission and then send the same man to his people to be used as a catalyst or an instrument of deliverance. This pattern runs through the entirety of scripture. He would raise unto himself a vessel to work out deliverance, emancipation and liberty from captivity or slavery. God has always found ways to use men and women to achieve his purposes on earth. He is still in the business of using people like you and me. John chapter 1 verse 6 reads, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. First and foremost, he was a man, yet he was sent from God. There was a man, not a God, not an angel, but a man. John the Baptist, even though he was a man, was nonetheless sent from God. His mission was to be a channel breaker and pathfinder to pave the way for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Historical accounts on the mighty move of the Spirit of God upon the face of the earth reveal that each move began with one man or with a handful of ordinary men. God is not a democrat. He can take nations with one man or just a few men. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go on to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. You see, we humans wait for the majority to vote for us, to support us, to affirm us, to endorse us. But God is saying, my vote will count for you as a majority. You don't have to wait for your village, your tribe, your city, or your nation to agree with the hand of God upon your life. If God says yes, then it is yes. God doesn't need multitude to bring about redemption or salvation to his people. He simply needs a man. He needs a man or a handful of people willing to give him what he needs to bring about revival. He needs individuals whose hearts have begun to draw from God in the place of intense fervent prayer born out of the heart. These people have the persuasion that God answers prayers. The flame of the heart of such an individual pursuing after God begins to draw the attention of other people who rally round him and having the same mind of pursuing after God, they begin to cry out to God. With such an ignited group of people praying and seeking the face of God on a constant basis, the fire of revival is kindled and burns brighter and hotter, drawing the attention of even more people to the cause. Ultimately, the flame of revival that began as a flicker grows to have impact on communities, nations, or even grows into global proportions as in most cases in history. There is no better time for revival to occur than in a time of apostasy. Apostasy, as earlier defined, is a season wherein the church has fallen away and has almost completely turned away from following the true and living God. 
We saw in Isaiah chapter 60 that light shines brighter in the midst of darkness. Elisha asked at the banks of the Jordan River, Where is the God of Elijah? But now, God is asking the church, Where are the Elijahs of God? It was against the critical backdrop of the departure from the worship of the true and living God that God sent a man called Elijah into the scene in Samaria. Elijah was a nonconformist, a radical and a fiery prophet. The name Elijah means the Lord is God. Elijah did not come to maintain the status quo of apostasy of his generation. He was a change agent. As a matter of fact, whenever Elijah showed up on the scene, he made life uncomfortable for the ungodly. People who were once comfortable living a life of falsehood, immorality and greed began to shift uneasily. Their seared consciences that made what was wrong appear right in their eyes were convicted. A People in Need The situation of our nations today begs for divine intervention. It is becoming difficult today to get two believers to agree on right and wrong. One believer says it is wrong to drink alcohol and the other says it is right to drink. One argues that it is okay to smoke and the other disagrees. We argue over all kinds of things and the reason is we have compromised and rationalized to such a degree that the word of God has begun to lose value like it was under Eli's priesthood before God called Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 1. When the word of God says something is right or wrong, let's not rationalize it with the excuse of being under pressure. We have a lot of talk today but very little power to show for it. We are lacking in power because we have assessed issues based on the situation rather than the word of God who is the judge of all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 20, it reads, For the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. In other words, the only way to see the kingdom of God is to see the raw naked power of God being demonstrated. We have talked too much and too long. In this day, in this generation, we must go for power. It is time to go for power, for the world will listen no longer until they see power. In Judges 16, we read that Samson, a mighty man in Israel, compromised with sin so much that he eventually lost his power and glory in the laps of Delilah. Samson was so mightily used by God. He was called to be a ruler and a judge over the covenant nation Israel, but Samson was so filled with compromise he lost everything in Delilah's laps. He who once single-handedly rooted armies ended up in his last days with his eyes gouged out. He died a terrible death because he rationalized his covenant. The present-day church has come into a season of great possibilities and opportunities. We cannot afford to trade our individual and collective destinies for Esau's pot of pottage. We cannot exchange the eternal for the ephemeral. We must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Somebody once said, and I repeat, Quote, whatever you compromise to get, you will compromise to keep. End quote. Listen, no matter the situation, the glory of your destiny is far greater and more valuable than the temporal benefits any kind of compromise can give you today. Hey, Samson, leave that Delilah alone. And just in case you think that Delilah was the only woman in whose lap Samson laid his head, let me meet you where you are. Delilah is whatever lures you away from God's presence. Your car can be your Delilah. Your house can be your Delilah. Your job can be your Delilah. Even your children, as lovely as they are, can be your Delilah. Jesus said, anyone who loves his family more than him doesn't truly love him. He was saying in essence, your love for me should be so great that your love for your family will be considered as hatred in comparison with it. This is captured in Luke chapter 14 verse 26. It's time to deal with your areas of compromise. Leave the areas where you easily fall short. One wrong step often leads to other wrong steps until you find that you have hit the point of no return where you are not able to go back again. You are not able to control yourself because you have hit the self-destruction button. The Power of Consistency Let's review something a little more. In Judges chapter 16, verses 16 to 17, it reads, And it came to pass, when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There had not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. 
If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Samson began by telling Delilah all kinds of lies about the source of his power. He started with strings and ropes, and the more lies he told, the nearer they were to his head. If you lock up the locks of my hair, that is where my power is. Here in this text, she pressed him daily. That sounds like the devil, doesn't it? The devil is so persistent, so resilient. He has a way of just knocking on a particular door of your life tirelessly. You know, when a force begins to hit at a particular spot, the force may not be so powerful, but the consistency of repetition weakens the spot gradually, and after some time, that spot caves in, not because of the strength of the force, but because of consistency. Devil is Diablo in Greek, and it means one who deals a repetitive blow. Delilah pressed on him daily with her words and urged him, so eventually Samson told Delilah where the source of his power was, and immediately he was shaved and his power left him. In Judges chapter 16 verse 20 it reads, And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He said, I will go out as at other times. This is the most dangerous place for anybody to get to that point where the presence has departed, where the fire has left a man and he does not even know. Sadly, the account of Samson depicts a state of the church in our day. Many people are right now at best a shadow of what they used to be. Many assume that the fire of God's presence will always be there no matter what they did wrong or where they went wrong. Some thought they could carelessly keep the fire without doing something about it. Some thought they could dance with sin and still maintain the fire of the Holy Ghost with a simple, God forgive me my sins. Others thought as long as they didn't fall down and die after a season of compromise in their lives, God has given them pardon and they could move on to do it again and the fire of the Lord will still be there. Samson said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. He took the anointing too casually. He did not know that the fire of the Lord had departed from him. It is the most fearful thing for the fire to depart from a man, but it is even more frightening for the man not to know that the fire has lifted. It is possible for the presence of the Lord to leave without the man even identifying where or when the fire left. When the presence and the fire of God begins to withdraw from a person's life, there is nothing dramatic, no storms, no tempest, no billows. It normally happens gradually, unannounced and without much ado. The Holy Spirit is so sensitive, he is so tender, he withdraws without noise. There is typically no fanfare to his withdrawal, he is not a disturbing spirit. That's why you need to cherish the presence of the Lord upon your life. Nothing in this life is as important as having the tangible presence and fire of God burning upon your life. Nothing can possibly compare or equate with the eternal value of the fire of God burning in your life. It is a jewel of inestimable value. When a man climbs up a staircase, he requires more energy to go from one level to the next. But it is easy for someone to push him from the top and he goes all the way down in just an instant. It is easier to go down than to go up. Our assignment in this hour, this day and this generation is to learn what is needful to incubate fire until we reach combustion. You need to be a man or woman of God given to consistency in the place of prayer. Stoke the fire. You need to be someone who makes all the efforts necessary to ensure that the fire of Pentecost that God has ignited upon your life does not dwindle but burns and burns until you become a ball of fire. I like what David said when he prayed passionately to God in Psalm 51 verses 11 to 12. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence. David knew the value of being in the presence of the Lord. This was a man who clearly placed a premium on the fire of God upon his life. You need to focus on the fire and the presence of the Lord in your life. Many would rather have money in their bank accounts than the fire of God upon their lives. Many prefer a fleet of exotic cars to the fire of God. Many add titles and degrees like a thermometer, but let the fire of God upon their souls dwindle. We have to learn to stoke the fire. 
We must not relax until we become balls of fire too dangerous for the enemy to handle, too hot for sicknesses and diseases to dare, and too hot for poverty to come near. We need to fan the fire until it bursts into a Holy Ghost inferno. The fire of God doesn't fall upon an empty altar. There has to be an acceptable sacrifice upon the altar for the fire to fall upon, and we are the living sacrifice. This is in Romans chapter 12 verse 1. You need the fire of the Holy Ghost to fall upon the altar of your soul when church attendance is becoming a mere ritual and religious obligation to you. When you struggle to keep up a consistent personal prayer life, you need the fire of the Holy Ghost to fall upon your life. When reading the Bible becomes boring and a thing of duty, you need the fire of the Holy Ghost to burn upon your soul. When you struggle to be a liberal and cheerful giver, you need the fire of the Holy Ghost to light up your soul. When you struggle to reach out to souls because you are still shy or ashamed of the name of Jesus, you need the fire of the Holy Ghost to set your heart aflame. When you gratify the desires of the flesh more than the desires of the Spirit and easily miss or ignore the leading of the Spirit of God, you need the fire of the Holy Ghost to sanctify your soul. When you are still struggling with selfishness or self-centeredness and can't love others like Jesus loves you, you need the fire of the Holy Ghost to revitalize your soul. When your heart has become so seared with hot iron that you hear words like these, yet remain unmoved or refuse to respond, then you really need the fire of the Holy Ghost. This is what the revival is all about. It is about the release of the fire and the presence of God upon human souls to awake them from spiritual stupor and apostasy. The Fire from Above There are three common emblems of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, wind, water and fire. But for the scope of this study, let us focus on fire. In Genesis chapter 19 verse 24, it reads, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Also in Exodus chapter 3 verse 2, it reads, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Also in Exodus chapter 13 verse 21, it reads, and the Lord went with them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 38, it reads, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Also in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 26, it reads, and David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1, it reads, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. This is in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. In 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 10, it reads, And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Also in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, it reads, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah was taken by the whirlwind into heaven. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, it reads, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4 reads, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, as it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This self-same fire of the Holy Ghost is still falling on people. It is still burning in the church today. By the way, 
the Bible calls you as a minister of the Lord a flame of fire. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 7 it reads, And of the angels of the Lord he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire? God designed for you to be a flame of fire, but contrary to divine design, many believers today are greatly lacking in spiritual fervor. Many of such lives have gone into a cruise control mode of being spiritually cold and hence they have a hard time beating off unwarranted harassment by the enemy. I often say you never see a fly perch on a hot frying pan. That would be a mystery. Why? The heat of the frying pan knows how to send away things that ought not to be on top of it. When we are ignited with the fire of the Holy Ghost, we become danger spots for satanic activities. There is great wickedness abiding and abounding in the world today. Any believer who will triumph must learn how to ignite and flare up flames that fill his or her life with the fire of the Holy Ghost. Now, fire is in varying degrees of scope and intensity. The size and heat of the fire you carry today isn't sufficient for the kind of test you are going to face tomorrow. The fire that was upon your life yesterday is insufficient for the tests and trials the enemy is bringing into your life today. Yes, you have fire, but for where God is taking you to, that fire is not enough. You need to purpose in your heart that you will do whatever is needful to increase your carrying capacity for the fire of the Holy Ghost. The greater challenges ahead require greater fire to handle them. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 10 says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. It seems to me that the reason people faint it's not that the challenges were so intense or not conquerable. I believe it is because they did not have enough firepower within them to match the challenge. No matter how intense the challenge is, if you learn how to increase the fire within you, what was a test yesterday will become a testimony today. Therefore, when you find yourself in another season of challenge, test or trial, don't faint, don't cave in, don't become discombobulated and don't begin to think the challenge is too much for you. What you need to do is to go into your closet, shut the door and commune with your God who sees you in secret. Ensure that in your secret place where nobody sees or knows what you are doing, you are stoking up fire in prayer. When you stir up those flames of fire and come out to confront your challenge again, you realize that because you have come out with greater intensity of fire, what was a stumbling block has become a stepping stone for your next level of breakthrough. The fire of God upon your life is what will distinguish you amongst other believers. When the fire of God comes upon a believer, it takes that man from obscurity to visibility. When the fire of God comes upon the life of a man, he won't need multimedia. You won't need handbills to advertise your business. When the fire of the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you don't need to look for a man to marry or a woman to marry. Your life becomes self-announcing. It is the fire of the Holy Ghost that came upon the apostles of old such that their lives and message became attractive and compelling. The fire will make you rebel against diseases. It will make you rebel against being refused, rejected or denied. The fire will make you rebel against all the sufferings you have been through. The fire will make you rebel against the enemy and anything that has oppressed you. Stop being such a gentleman. Stop being such a lady. You have been too calm for a miracle. You need the fire of the Holy Ghost. When you see a man set afire by the Holy Ghost, he knows no fear, he knows no worry, he knows no anxiety. He is like a man who is drunk with wine and who operates beyond the earthly realm. Oh, that you will be a burning bush, burning but not consumed, burning but not destroyed. Get down to stoke the fire. You can't keep calm and expect the fire to fall on you. Victorious Christians don't keep quiet, they roar. Open your mouth wide, God says, and I will fill it. This is in Psalm 81 verse 10. As ministers in this generation, we need to get on fire and release it with words of power. We need to rediscover the roots of the power of the church by returning to the good old-fashioned Bible messages. We should take heed not to replace the miraculous with philosophies and technology. In David's days, they tried to carry the ark on a cart. The cart was a symbolic of modern-day 21st century technology, but the ark was never supposed to be carried by civilization or modernization. The ark was to be carried on the rugged, sanctified, consecrated shoulders of priests. 
The internet and multimedia can help us, but the gospel will only be authenticated by power and prosperity in the final analysis. Whenever the fire falls, it comes to consume and to refine. It comes to consume everything that our God has not planted. So the process of giving our all to the Lord is one that is not particularly easy and enjoyable to the flesh. But if you really want the fire to fall upon you, you have to be willing to give up the things you know are not godly. Catching fire of the Holy Ghost requires that we are indeed willing to give our all to the Lord, not just in partiality, but in totality. Whatever stands in your way of advancement in the pathway that God has ordained for you to go through has to go. In other words, it requires your all. This is no walk in the park. It is a war of flesh versus spirit. The winner is determined by your mind's focus, the word or the world. Three types of baptism. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, it reads, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This speaks about three levels of baptism. 1. Baptism with water. 2. Baptism with the Holy Ghost. And 3. Baptism with fire. Baptism with water is an outward sign of regeneration after the new birth. Baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire was what we saw on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 it reads, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. You are not baptized with tongues, you are baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus was not anointed with the Holy Ghost and tongues. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 reads, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Also, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it reads, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You shall be a witness when power comes upon you. Not tongues, but power. We in the church seem to think that the terminal point of our baptism is to speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. Fire. It is possible to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and lack the fervency of the fire of God upon your life. There are believers who have been baptized, but their tongues have become dry and rusty. When your tongues are exercised in the place of prayer, there is a rumbling when you pray. You can find this in Acts chapter 4 verse 31. Being born again is one level. Baptism with the Holy Ghost is the next level. But the church has failed to understand that the people who were filled in Acts chapter 2 were filled again and again. As reflected in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, Acts chapter 3 verse 10, Acts chapter 4 verse 31, and Acts chapter 13 verse 52. One mistake we make as believers is thinking that the moment we were baptized with the Holy Ghost, It was all we needed for the rest of our lives. But no, we need to keep going back for refilling again and again in order to stay full and fresh. How to be daily filled with the Holy Spirit Now one of the keys to the infilling of the Holy Spirit is to release yourself to pray in the language of the Spirit, that's speaking in tongues. The Bible says he who prays in tongues edifies himself. That is, he builds up or charges himself up like a battery. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4. It is not enough to be born again. You need the baptism of fire. However, if you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, don't stop there. Keep receiving infilling for sustained strength and vitality. Fire speaks of power and dominion. Fire speaks of authority. Fire speaks of deliverance from bondage. You need the fire of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the baptism in water and the baptism in the Holy Ghost. But you have to learn how to call down fire again and again. In 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 30 to 39, it reads, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. 
and all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran around about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. How to call down fire from heaven 1. Repair the altar The first thing we see Elijah do in the scripture is to repair the altar of the Lord that was broken down. This is in verse 30. If you are going to call down fire that is acceptable, you must learn how to repair your broken altar. You must set your heart right to seek the Lord and put away everything that contradicts the integrity of your faith. 2. Cut a covenant with God. He took 12 stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, as reflected in verse 31. 12 stones speaks of covenant like the memorial stones Joshua set up in Gilgal as reflected in Joshua chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 and 20 to 24. Engage the covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. Remind yourself that He is a God of covenant. He will do what He says He will do in your life. He will fulfill His promises to you. His promises are yes and amen, as reflected in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 19 to 20. He is a God of covenant. 3. Align with scriptural pattern. With the twelve stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, in verse 32. You must rebuild your altar, not in your name, but in the name of the Lord. In other words, if you are going to get the attention of heaven, whatever you are doing on the earth must be in the heavenly pattern. As you see your father do, you must do too. Your prayer must be in the name of the Lord. In Micah chapter 4 verse 5, it reads, For all people will walk everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 17, it reads, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. 4. Demonstrate your faith. Elijah asked for water to be poured in the trench three times until the trench began to overflow. In verses 33 to 35, when you believe in the God that answers by fire, you have to so express your trust in Him that you do things you know in the natural will make it impossible for God to do what He said He will do if He were not God. You must demonstrate your faith. For instance, when God asks you to leave a particular job, it is not comfortable to leave that job because you don't know where He's taking you to. He said to Abraham, Leave your kindred, your people, to a place where I will show you. I haven't shown you, but I will show you. Now it takes trust to leave this job and let God prove to the world that He asked you to leave. This is what happens when you put a sacrifice on the altar. You are saying, God, I trust you to be my source. I don't have anything left in my pocket, but I trust you to be my source. I trust that you are my supplier and so my supply can never run dry. I believe you. Elijah poured water until the altar became drenched and then he called for fire. The fire of God fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the stones, the wood, the dust, and even licked up the water. The effect of the fire was total. In the same way today, the fire is waiting for you to set things in order. The fire of the Holy Ghost is going to rest upon you, and when it does, 
it will do the impossible in your life. As the anointing of the Lord comes upon you, there is going to come a displacement of yokes and burdens from your life. Fear is a tormenting spirit. The Lord has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Chapter 4 The Effects of the Anointing In Psalm 92 verses 10 to 13, it reads, But my horn, which is an emblem of excessive strength and stately grace, you have exalted like that of a wild ox. I am anointed with fresh oil. My eyes look upon those who lie in wait for me. My ears hear the evil doers that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, be long-lived, stately, upright, useful, and fruitful. They shall grow like the cedar of Lebanon, which is majestic, stable, durable, and incorruptible. Planted in the house of the Lord, they shall flourish in the courts of our God. What does it mean to flourish like a palm tree? It means to live long and be prosperous while at it. They that be planted, not in the courts, but in the house of the Lord, shall flourish. God is about to release his fresh oil upon your life. That means whatever was stale in your life and every form of dryness are about to be visited with freshness. He will give you both the former and the latter rain, so that you are sowing at the same time you are reaping. Your seeds from this day forward will receive harvest, not in arithmetic progression, but in geometric progression. You will receive not just addition, but indeed multiplication in harvest. When scripture says Isaac sowed in the land and reaped a hundredfold in the same year, in Genesis chapter 26 verse 12, it is not talking about a 365 day year. It means he reaped in his season. He was fruitful in season as it is in Psalm 1 verse 3. That means as you begin by faith to sow seeds of your time, commitment, meditation, waiting, and watching, heaven is bringing you to a hundredfold. But how? By the anointing. It is the anointing that makes the difference. In recent times, I have been thinking more and pondering on the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It will seem quite evident that the body of Christ is yet to comprehend the full import of the person, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit. It has been often said to our shame that if the Holy Spirit were to be lifted from many of our churches today, we will still do 90% of the things that we do in the same way. That is to say, perhaps the good number of the teachings we say and do may not altogether be inspired by the Holy Ghost like we assume they are. There is certainly an indictment of the church globally and might explain the apparent paucity of the power of the Holy Ghost today. As we read and study the 28th chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, we see quite a difference in experience between the church of the first century and the church of our time. For instance, when was the last time anybody's shadow healed the sick, raised the dead, and cast out devils? When was the last time an Ananias and Sapphira that came to the church and offered strange seed saw instant judgment? When was the last time a handkerchief or apron from the body of a minister or even just any son of God was able to bring about healing to someone? Just think of these things and you realize what I mean. In the first century church, we see the Holy Ghost was clearly acknowledged as the third person of the Godhead and was given absolute freedom to move amidst his people. The activities of the first century church were clearly God-inspired, they were God-driven and they were God-directed by the person of the Holy Ghost. At a particular point in time, the Spirit drove Philip from Samaria to meet an Ethiopian eunuch to explain the word of God. The man was reading from Isaiah. Philip brought understanding and salvation to him and then was caught away to Azotus in a Holy Ghost flight. Strange acts we find in the Acts of the Apostles. Actually, I think a better name should be Acts of the Holy Ghost, not Acts of the Apostles, because really, it was the Holy Ghost that worked through those men and women. The Holy Ghost was allowed to be in charge and indeed be Lord over the affairs of the early church. This is the ideal of the present day church in spite of modernization and advancement in technology. In all that we know and do in contemporary times, the truth is that one can never really organize the Holy Ghost. 
The Holy Ghost must be invited to have sovereignty. We cannot modernize the anointing. We can't exchange human vessels for anything else, equipment, sound, ambience, light or smoke. The smoke we need is the glory of the Lord, not the make-believe effect we put up for our flesh. My Bible tells me that there was a point in time where the priests came together with instruments. They played and sang together and suddenly the glory descended. 2 Chronicles chapter 5 verse 7 and 11 to 14 reads, And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, to the oracle of the house, into the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified, and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were singers, all of them of Asaph, of Haman, of Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them an hundred and twenty priests, sounding with trumpets. It came even to pass, as the trumpets and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and praised to the Lord, saying, For he is good, and his mercy endureth for ever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. So the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. This is the real glory. We want the real stuff. Our smoke is in the glory of the Lord. It can heal nobody. It can change nobody. It is good for the eyes, good for the ambience, but it isn't the glory of the Lord. We must rededicate, release, yield and surrender ourselves to the person, presence and power of the Holy Ghost in our days as it is with our brothers of yesteryears. There is no substitute for the power and the glory. When we are dealing with this majestic person of the Holy Spirit, please bear in mind these two words, yield and surrender. We are to yield and surrender ourselves to the leading and dealing of the Holy Spirit if we must see His manifest glory. The Holy Spirit must be giving rule and dominion over our lives. Either He is Lord of all or He is not Lord at all. Believe me, this is a whole lot easier said than done. It is easy to assume you are yielding and surrender to the Holy Ghost. But when the robber meets the road, it's not that easy because human nature loves to be in control. Human nature thrives on security and comfort. Ironically, when you walk with the Holy Ghost, one of the things He is going to do in your life is to get you to the point where you are uncomfortable because you don't know the next act of your life. All you know is today. That is why Jesus didn't ask you to pray, Give me my bread for tomorrow. But, Give us this day our daily bread, as contained in Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Why is that so? He wants you not to bother about tomorrow. He wants you to trust the God of tomorrow, to know that the God who knows your today also knows that he will take care of your tomorrow. Your Christian life is initiated and sustained by faith. If you knew all the things you wanted to know about your future, you would likely not want to wake up tomorrow. We have to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our little understanding. If you allow your understanding get in the way of what God has in store for you, you will mess up your future. You have to advance by faith and let him take care of your details. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Herein lies a great paradox. Christians claim that they want to be led by the Spirit of God, yet at the same time, they want to be in control. The question is, do you want to be in control of your life or do you want the Holy Spirit to be in control of your life? If you want the Holy Spirit to be in control, then you must be willing to relinquish the reins and let go and let God. Decide once and for all, I let you lead me to where I should go tomorrow. I let you lead me to the place you have prepared for me, to the job, the marriage, the institution, the location. I let you lead and guide me. I let go and let God. Nobody ever left his or her future in the hands of God and regretted it. You won't be the first. I tell you, this is the place where things will begin to happen in your life that men cannot explain. Things that cannot be calculated by reasoning beyond the law of demand and supply beyond any economic paradigm, beyond any medical diagnosis or prognosis, beyond any counsel of any man, 
things will begin to happen at the behest of the Holy Ghost because you have let go and let God. We must be willing to lose control in order for the Holy Spirit to take full control of our lives and destinies. Self and the Holy Spirit cannot sit on the same throne of your heart. One must be dethroned. John says of Jesus, He must increase that I must decrease. This is in John chapter 3 verse 30. So as you are willing to decrease in every choice and decision, down to the details, the Holy Spirit will take control and give you a full life. After his resurrection, Jesus Christ showed himself to the disciples and he had these words to say to Simon Peter. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This is in John chapter 21 verse 18. When you are a young or newborn child of God, not yet grown into maturity, you go where you feel like going. And it's okay. It is permissible. But as you begin to mature in the things of God, the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to take the reins of your heart off your hands and begin to lead you to places you may not necessarily want to go. It was said concerning Jesus that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. But Mark specifically stated that the Spirit drove him. This is in Mark chapter 1 verse 12. There is a dimension of operation of the Holy Spirit that is not just leading, it is driving. This is what Paul is saying. Necessity is laid upon me to preach the gospel. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 16. It is necessary. It is part of my life. If I don't preach, I am dead. Some may have a choice, but others have a very clear call. They are under compulsion and the compulsion is so strong that if they step out of it, they are finished. Now, this is advanced class. It is not for children. The only place of safety in this life is in the will of Jehovah. The palace may have much, but if that is not what God has designed for you for that time, you are out of course. Oftentimes, it will appear that your life is out of control when the Holy Ghost is leading you. But to be honest, in the midst of the discomfort, there is peace and serenity. Have you been there in the middle of the storms, billows and tempest, but somehow there is inexplicable calm within you, knowing that it is going to be alright after a while? Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Jesus spoke quite a lot about the Holy Spirit. One of the things he said was, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. This is in John chapter 14, verses 16 to 18. You can know him, you can know his voice, his promptings and his leadings. He is called the Advocate, Helper, Teacher, Intercessor, Guide, Comforter, Counselor, etc. And Jesus assured you and me that he will be with us from now till the end of age, as contained in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Where you go, I go with you. I stand with you. He is with you, but he is also in you. Having an assurance that God is with you in the storm, will keep you in perfect peace in the midst of it all. Lifting Burdens and Destroying Yokes Now, let us talk about the burden lifting and yoke destroying function of the anointing by which the Holy Spirit manifests as the power of God. In Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27 it reads, And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Also in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, it reads, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. This is your season of open heavens. This is your hour of liberty. It is your turn for breakthrough, emancipation, and all-round healing you are breaking forth. Psalm 107 verse 20 reads, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let your spirit come alive. Let your faith be quickened. Mix these words with faith. Cycles of delay or near misses in your business, education, job promotion, 
childbearing or anywhere else are being broken permanently. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7 declares that the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform it. I can sense the rush of the anointing from my writing desk right now and I know it's finding expression as your faith connects with this grace right now. The hand of the Lord is resting upon you, the burden is being removed and the yoke destroyed because of the anointing. The word destroyed means to be obliterated, scattered and shattered to the degree that it cannot be gathered again. It is not momentary deliverance that lasts some months or years. I want you to see yourself free and free indeed. Have a mental picture of all-round freedom. John chapter 8 verse 36 says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Undoubtedly, the anointing and burdens are mutually exclusive. Like light and darkness, they can't cohabit. They can't become friends. One must go for the other. It is a law of displacement and replacement. As the anointing of the Lord comes upon you, there is going to come a displacement of yokes and burdens from your life. Fear is a tormenting spirit. The Lord has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. This is contained in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. As the anointing rests upon you, there is displacement of the spirit of fear. Whatever has haunted you, whatever has taunted you, from now, no more in the name of Jesus Christ. The cracks in your mind that the enemy crept through and gained access into your life are closed, mended, healed, and restored now in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Spirit Upon When David was anointed king amongst his brethren, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day. The anointing made the difference in his life. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, it reads, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. In the Old Testament, three sets of people were anointed, kings, priests, and prophets. In the New Testament, every child of God is anointed. There is the anointing within which we all have. When you are born again, you are anointed with the Holy Ghost. But the work of the anointing within you is to perfect your character to bear spiritual fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, etc. as contained in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. But whilst that is a good place to be, there is another dimension called the anointing upon, which becomes visible. Two people can present the same music or message, yet you can tell which one is anointed and which is disjointed. It is not about style, diction or grammar. It is about the unction. In Psalm 110 verse 3 it says, The people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Paying the price. Go for the anointing upon. It is not brought to the market. It is not believed for. There's a price to pay to stir it up. 1. Consecration. One side to this price is consecration. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 8, it reads, Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. There is a link between a white garment and the oil. In the pathway of consecration, you are saying, not everything is allowable. No. By virtue of my consecration, certain things are not allowable for me anymore. But the modern day church says, this is being legalistic. We are already anointed. All well and good. We have the anointing within, but please go for the anointing upon. That anointing is for work, for fulfilling mandate. You can be an anointed barber, anointed tailor, anointed wife, anointed husband, anointed preacher or anointed governor. That is what will distinguish you from everybody else. It is the anointing that makes the difference. 2. Prayer Another side of this practice is prayer. In Jude chapter 1 verse 20 it reads, But ye beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Pray in tongues every day. Charge yourself up like a battery. Something brightens up inside when your spirit is set ablaze. Your water level rises. You see, the anointing upon can be either increased or decreased. That is why the psalmist said, I will be anointed with fresh oil, not old steel oil. 3. Sacrifice The third side of the price for anointing is sacrifice. In Acts chapter 20 verse 35, it reads, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, 
and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. With sacrifice, you expand your capacity for more and draw heaven's response. You will say it's by his grace, but the fact is that grace empowers you to work willingly in doing God's good pleasure. As it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10 and Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. 4. Transference He that keeps company with the wise shall be wise. Joshua became wise because Moses laid hands upon him as it is in Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 9. Paul instructed his spiritual son Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6 where it reads, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. The woman with the issue of blood touched the helm of the garment of Jesus Christ and the anointing was transferred. This is contained in Luke chapter 8 verses 43 to 48. 5. The Word of God The Word of God is anointed. You can't keep studying and speaking the anointed Word and not grow in the anointing. In Luke chapter 5 verse 17 it says, And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Teaching the word brought the anointing. The word is anointed. Speak it and declare your inheritance in Christ. That is the anointing at work. There's a deep-seated assurance that goes beyond your comprehension, beyond your intellect and understanding, that as a blood-washed, sanctified child of the Almighty God, you have the assurance of victory, not only for all eternity, but also for the here and now. Chapter 5 The Next Level Anointing In Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 to 9, it reads, Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastwards. For the forefront of the house stood towards the east, and the waters came down from under, from the right side of the house, at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the outer gate by the way that looked eastward, and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forward eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again he measured a thousand, and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again he measured a thousand, and brought me through. The waters were to the loins. Afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then he said unto me, These waters issue out towards the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything which liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. Ezekiel spoke about the river flowing out from the temple of God. On the first level, it stopped at his ankles. On the second level, at his knees on the third level his waist, and finally he said the river rose to the level where he couldn't walk anymore and had to swim. The Bible tells us that everything that this river came in contact with was made to come to life. There is a level God desires to bring every one of us into. It is not the level of the ankles, the knees or the loins. It is the level where the water of life carries us in its waves. There is a level in your walk with God where your effort ceases, your toil ceases, your labor ceases. Your exertion ceases and the Spirit of the living God begins to carry you. That sounds like rest. Whether you are the ankle, knee or waist devil, God is still saying, Come up hither. 
Come up to the level where the river of life will carry you. There is coming a place of ease. There is coming a place of rest. There is coming a place where before you ask, your God will show up. There is coming a place where before you even finish thinking, your God will show up. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think as reflected in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. It is the realm of heaven causing things to work together for your good at the speed of thought. Get ready for the next level anointing. The river of anointing is about to carry you. Your days of sweating, your days of suffering, your days of laboring, your days of pulling out your hair, your days of tears, they are all over. Welcome to the next level of anointing, the level of ease, the level of favor, the level of grace, the level where it is no longer by your power or might, but by the Spirit of God. Child of the living God, there is no greater joy in this life than to know and be known by the Almighty God. There is nothing as satisfying as to know that the God who made the heaven and earth doesn't just know you as a distinctive figure on the earth, but He is your Father and you are His own very child. Knowing God on a very personal basis brings with it a very deep sense of internal security that after all is said and done, you have peace in and with God, but above all, you also have the peace of God in your heart. There's a deep-seated assurance that goes beyond your comprehension, beyond your intellect and understanding, that as a blood-washed, sanctified child of the Almighty God, you have the assurance of victory, not only for all eternity, but also in the here and now. Salvation guarantees your victory both in eternity and in everyday issues. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it reads, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. If you are a child of God, you are destined to rule in eternity, but you are also destined to reign in everyday life. For everything that comes up against you every waking moment, God said, I have guaranteed victory for you. There is a difference between knowing God and knowing about God. Sometimes believers confuse the two, but it is very possible to know about somebody and not really know that person. For example, we all know about the President of the United States of America, but only a few can claim to have a personal relationship, a one-on-one -on -one rapport with him. In the same way, many people have stopped at the level of knowing about God through bedtime stories about what God did with the children of Israel or what God did through the apostles and prophets and modern ministers. They hear how he parted the Red Sea and the Jordan River, how he opened blind eyes, caused barren wombs to carry their own seed and turn around in possible situations, but they fail to know the self-same God one-on-one. -on -one. Yet, he is still the same God today, as it says in Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8, it reads, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. The Jesus that you read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is still the same. Everything you saw him do in the Gospels, he is still doing today. His strength has not waned. His wisdom is not abridged. The God of yesterday is the self-same God of today. There are many people who are in our churches today who clap at the right time, jump at the right time, shout at the right time and do all the things that everybody else does. Yet, at best, they only know about God. God has not called us to know about Him. He has called us to know Him personally. Knowing God goes beyond church attendance, tithes and offerings, making prayers or even trying to be a witness of the gospel. It is so sad that some people come into the association of those who know God, but somehow this association doesn't rub off positively to influence them to know God as well. As the pastor of different churches over the years, I am deeply amazed and amused at the same time to see and hear of all kinds of atrocities and negative lifestyle that people still choose to live even after attending wonderful local assemblies for many years. In the very same church where the word of God is preached without hypocrisy, fear or favor, where you hear testimonies about lives being transformed and people breaking forth and breaking through on all sides, we still find individuals living a life of deceit and of double standards. You see one person in church on Sunday morning and a completely different person at work on Monday morning. They act like saints or angels in church on Sunday, but right as they step into their workplace on Monday, they behave like the very devil himself. I personally find this contradiction very worrisome. 
How can a person look so saintly in church? But out there in the world, where we are called to be light and influence society for good, he or she lives a contradictory lifestyle. The church is not where we are called to express our Christian virtues. It is a place to build up those virtues, a place to exchange your weakness for the strength of the Lord. For we grow from strength to strength as we appear in Zion, as it is in Psalm 84 verses 4 to 9. Zion is a place to refuel your tank, to refresh your anointing, to refi your spiritual energy and to refill your strength. The place to live the life of Christ is not the church per se, but out there in the world. Jesus called himself the light of the world and then sent us out as the light of the world too. Furthermore, we are the salt of the earth and light of the world. But many of us are trying to be light and salt of the church. It is no wonder people struggle to be the preacher because the preacher is in the spotlight. There is only one light of the church and it is not even your pastor. It is Jesus Christ. In his light, we see light as contained in Psalm 36 verse 9. We are not called to light up the church but to go forth and light up the world. If you are a carpenter, you ought to light up your shop. If you are a doctor, you ought to light up your clinic. If you are a lawyer, you ought to light up your chambers. If you are a policeman, you ought to light up the streets. The place to shine is not the church. The place to shine is the world. We are the salt of the earth and light of the world, but many of us are trying to be light and salt of the church. It is obvious there's a whole lot of pretense and hypocrisy going on in many of our churches today. Little wonder we are not seeing the power of God in our gatherings as we ought to see it. In the first place, we need to understand that the God we serve is an all-seeing God. He is an all-knowing God and He cannot be deceived. The Bible says we shall not be deceived for God is not mocked. We will reap what we sow as contained in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. You may be able to deceive your pastor, your church folks, your colleagues at work and even your family members. But guess what? The all-seeing eyes of God see you in the very place where you are. I'm not talking about those who fall and rise again. I'm talking about those who have mastered the art of staying down on the ground and don't even desire to come up. They enjoy the game of having one leg in church and another leg in the world. They are simply delighted in the life of hypocrisy, deceit and lies. I really believe it is high time we engaged ourselves in a heart-to-heart -heart talk if the end time church must witness the outflow of the glory of the Lord. We need to get to do what I call a Holy Ghost cleanup campaign. We have to allow the broom of the Holy Ghost sweep out the things in and around us that God has not planted. The Bible says the axe is laid on the root of the tree and any tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down to the ground. This is in Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. You have to be sincere enough to ask the Holy Spirit, use your broom, use your fire and burn up all chaff, cut down every plant, clean out every element that is not of God in my life. Ask the Holy Spirit to do with you as he pleases. Not my will, but thine be done. With that prayer, you are releasing your life into the hands of God. You have bound yourself to his very will, such that when you try to turn to the left or to the right, even when it seems you are about to go out of line, because you pray that prayer of consecration, he knows how to orchestrate everything to work together for your good and ensure that you are ultimately realigned with his purposes. Jesus prayed this same prayer facing the cross, so he knows the feeling. His flesh cried out, Let this cup pass over me. But he realized this is the very reason why I was sent into the world, to bear the price for the human race to be saved. He declared, Not my will, but yours be done in surrender. The Church of the Lord Jesus Christ has come to a point where we make up our minds that we have had enough of vacillating between self and spirit. Prophet Elijah came to Mount Carmel and called for Israel to choose as reflected in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. How long shall ye halt between two opinions? I think that is the question to be asked of the 21st century church. How long will we live in the land of compromise? How long will we live in hypocrisy and pretense? How long will we live a life of self-deceit? I've been on this block ministry for many years by the grace of God and I've seen quite a few things happen in and out of the church. If there is something the church needs today, it is to pray for the fear of the Lord. 
We have gotten so familiar with God and the things of God that we have lost holy reverence for Him. I know He is gracious. If there is someone who preaches about the grace of God, I am more so. As Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. But having preached the grace of God, we must also warn men about the severity of God. The Bible says, By the fear of God, men depart from evil. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6, When the fear of the Lord grips your soul, there are certain things you won't do anymore. When God spoke to Israel from Mount Sinai, they feared the voice and told Moses, Tell God to stop talking. You go and hear his voice and let us hear from you whatever he tells us. But God said, No, I want you to hear my voice, so my fear will be in your soul, and by my fear you will depart from iniquity. Then we will be ready for the glory. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the end time is destined for glory and exaltation, according to prophet Isaiah. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2 The church in the wilderness is a small fry compared to the church of today. The church in Acts of the Apostles was only the beginning of what God had in store for us. That was the former reign, but the Bible talks about the former reign and the latter reign coming together. In Joel chapter 2 verse 23, we are privileged to be among those who are to experience the joint effect of the former and the latter reign. Psalm 110 verses 1 to 3 reads, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thy enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy mouth. Zion is the church. I believe there is coming a day that is called the day of his power, before the coming of the Lord. In other words, before Jesus will come to take the church that is blood-washed and blood-bought, and without spot or wrinkle, he says, I am going to display my power and my glory through the church like never before. God has purposed and destined that the church of the last days will experience such outpouring of his power before his coming to rule in the midst of his enemies. The church will bear rule over the enemies of God, over everything that is an enemy to man. We will rule over financial lack, over sicknesses, over diseases, over areas of retrogression and backwardness, over everything that is an enemy of God's purposes. Now that the Holy Ghost rules over us, we can rule over the enemies of God and man. You have not been called to be a slave or a servant, but to be a ruler. You are called to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? You are not a slave. You are a king with the king of kings. You are a prince with the prince of peace. You are no servant. Solomon points out that something is wrong when slaves are on horseback, while blue-blooded princes, born into royalty, are walking and laboring under the sweltering heat of the sun. Good news is that the story is about to change. Everybody who is sitting upon your horse, upon your throne, is about to be dethroned. Your days of begging are over. Your days of slavery are over. Your days of crawling are over. Your days of not having enough are over. Your days of wilderness existence are over. Your days of abundance and dominion have begun as you attend to the counsel of God as expressed in these couple of chapters. Rule, despite your enemies. Your enemies don't have to die for you to gain the victory. You simply rule in their midst. You see, success tastes better when your enemies are alive to see you shine. Don't pray, Lord, kill my enemies, let them die. No, rather pray, Father, let them live to see what you will make out of my life. Why should you be in the place alone with nobody to see what God has done? Everyone that laughed at you will be alive to laugh with you. Those that mocked you and said nothing good would come out of your life would live to see you experience a forceful turnaround. All those who said you came out from the wrong side of life will live to see God take you from nowhere to somewhere and from zero to hero. Welcome to the new dawn. This is the day of his power. This book is a prophetic and apostolic guide for stepping into that day. It's instructive to take a closer look at our text. That is Psalm 110, verses 1 to 3. The Lord said unto thy Lord, 
Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The psalmist makes connection between holiness and the day of his power. You can't separate power from holiness. Power and holiness go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Indeed, purity begets power. In the Old Testament, whenever God wanted to visit the children of Israel, He will tell them to prepare. There must be a preparation in anticipation for divine visitation. If I told you today that the president of our nation was going to show up at your house at noon tomorrow, you would go into preparation. You would begin tonight to wash everything washable and clean everything cleanable. You would make sure to bring the best dishes to serve him. You prepare because someone of honor is about to show up. You will not normally want your visitor to meet your living room in a mess. In like manner, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is about to show up. His eyes are purer than to behold iniquity, as put in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. The Holy God, before whom the angels prostrate crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, is about to show up. God is about to show up on your job. He is about to show up in your home. He is about to show up in your business. He is about to show up in your favor. He is about to show up in your broken places. Glory is about to hit the church. We must be prepared. Scripture speaks of Jesus preparing the church, his bride, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. Satisfaction and cleansing of the church goes before glorification. Your level of expectation of what God is about to do in your life this season will determine your level of preparation. Many people are not really expecting anything major, and so their preparation is sketchy and minimal. They have mere wishes with no force of Bible hope, which is expectation. It's time to let folks know from the way you walk and the way you talk that you are expecting something to happen. There are certain places you should not go and things you should not be found doing. This is not because you are trying to prove a point but because you know God has marked you out for glory. You just can't be like others that have no such hope. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, it says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4, it reads, That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You will be a vessel unto honor if you purge yourself, not if God purges you. Being used by God for glory and honor is hinged on your purging of yourself, so the choice is yours to make. Anyone who is purged qualifies as a vessel of honor unto God. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14, it says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Glory is coming to the end-time body of Christ. As you see the waters cover the sea, likewise has God foreordained and predestined that at the time of the end, the knowledge of the glory of God will fill the earth. That is heaven's mandate for the church, that glory will fill the earth. In Haggai chapter 2 verse 9, it reads, The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Everything we have read in the Holy Bible is little compared to what God is set to do in and through our lives in this time and age. Ye must be born again. The very first step to purification in preparation for the coming glory is to be born again. I don't want to take this for granted. If you are not born again, remember that God is not the one pushing you away. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. You have to confess Jesus as Lord of your life, believing in his death and resurrection for you. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 10 reads, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It doesn't take much to win God's vote. It doesn't take trying to please Him. You need God to please God. By yourself, you can't please God. The ABC of Salvation A. Accept that you are a sinner outside Christ. 
B. Believe that Jesus paid the price for your forgiveness. C. Confess him as your Lord and Savior. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 5 to 6, it reads, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. There comes a time for self-examination. Going to church or occupying a leadership seat doesn't make you a believer. Clapping in church doesn't make you heaven-bound. Tithes and offerings in a good local assembly don't make you saved. You are either saved and safe or unsaved and unsafe. The only way to be saved is to acknowledge that you are a sinner and accept the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary in his death, burial and resurrection. The new birth experience is the only entry point. In the manner of Ezekiel 47, the activities of the Holy Ghost are different levels, ankle level, the knee level, the waist level and the overwhelming level. Levels of the activity of the Holy Ghost The levels of spiritual rebirth the ankle level can be linked to spiritual rebirth. Being born again is the first step into the realm of Holy Ghost power. There's a great comparison between the spiritually reborn child of God who needs to grow and develop into maturity in the things of the Spirit on the one hand and the physically newborn baby who needs to grow and develop into physical maturity in the natural on the other. The way to grow and develop is to be hungry for the Word, feed on it and exercise in it. That is, be a doer of the Word. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says, As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 to 15, it says, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby the lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. God wants you to grow up. The Bible says the entire creation waits earnestly for the manifestation of the sons of God. In Romans chapter 8 verse 19, the world is waiting for sons. This is not physical growth, but spiritual growth, and it comes by desire. We must desire to know God above everything else. In knowing Him, everything else falls into place. You can't know God and not be known by men. It is in your knowing God that you attract good things before men. You cannot hear the voice of God and men will not hear your voice. Men listen to you because you have heard from God. Take the time to be with Him and hear Him, fellowship with Him and let His anointing, His perfume rub off on you. There is a parallel between physical growth and spiritual growth. You and I know that people grow based on two basic things, the right diet and right exercise. In like manner, you grow spiritually by eating the right diet and taking the right exercises. Jeremiah the prophet said he found God's word to be edible fruit and he loved munching on it. This is in Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 16. So the word of God is food as inferred by Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 which says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God's word is to be eaten. Reading is one level, hearing is another, but you eat by meditation. And when it is digested into your system, it becomes a part of you and begins to redefine your life. You become, in a sense, the Word made flesh. Now the Word speaks to you. You can now make decrees like the prophets of old. And because your Word is one with God's, your words come to pass. They no longer fall on the ground, but they bear visible fruits. 2. The Level of the Holy Ghost Baptism The first level, the new birth, is likened to a well. Jesus speaking to the woman by the well of Samaria said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. This is in John chapter 4 verses 13 to 14. The time you said yes to Jesus is likened to a well with water. The next level is the infilling with the Spirit. Everybody can be filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not for a select few. The Holy Ghost is for all who believe and receive. Jesus said the Father is more than willing to give us the Holy Ghost. In Luke chapter 11 verses 11 to 13, it reads, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? 
Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? There are certain battles in which just being born again will not be enough to gain victory. As a born-again believer, you need the Holy Ghost to take you to the next level of readiness and empowerment for warfare and battle. He who speaks in tongues speaks mysteries unto God and no man understands him, as contained in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 2. There are things you communicate with your Father in the Holy Ghost that neither the devils nor man can understand. These prayers in the Spirit can't be truncated or cut short because they are direct hotline to the throne of grace. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Being filled with the Holy Ghost can be likened to the river dimension. Both the river and the well depend on the rain. If there is a drought, the well will dry up. Some people's wells of salvation have been drying up because they have been out of His presence. We need the rain to refresh us again and again. Spiritual growth is not determined by your fleet of cars, your spread of houses, or your fat bank accounts. It is determined by the weight you carry in the realm of the Spirit. And if you really grow spiritually, things around you in the natural will grow to measure up with your spiritual growth. Many times people focus on the growth in the natural, yet the Bible says that man's life is not measured based on the abundance of his possession. This is in Luke chapter 12 verse 15. Men may commend you for your asset base or your wealth, but with God, the rule of measurement is not what you have. It is how well you know him. For the Bible says those that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. This is in Daniel chapter 11 verse 32. It does not say those who increase their bank accounts, get married or have children, but those who know the Lord. Do you want to do exploits? It is not by struggle. It is by desiring to know him and going for it. 3. Level of the Anointing In Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 it says, Now I say that the heir as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be the Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Children can come under bondage to the elements. Certain challenges you are dealing with today are not an indication of the strength of the devil. They are simply a clarion call by God for you to grow up. God is placing a demand on you to grow up because the anointing of yesterday is not enough to confront the battles of today. Your victories of yesterday can only act as encouragement because you are faced with the battle on a different level today. You may be wondering, why am I fainting? Why am I tired? Why am I giving up? All it takes is for you to upgrade your anointing of yesterday to the level you need to fight the battles of today. When you are confronting a new devil, it is a sign that you are in a completely new level of anointing. You are changing levels from the ankles to the knees, to the loins, to the overflowing river. You can face the enemies arrayed against you. New challenges come with new anointing. So when you face challenges, see God anointing you to conquer and go on to the next level. As you exercise yourself, your spiritual muscles become stronger. We all become stronger because of the type of devils we fought yesterday. Every time the enemy rears up his head against my life and my destiny and it seems like all hope is gone with my back to the wall, I realize this is not the end. This is not the picture of my future that God showed me. And somehow or another, a new level of anointing rises up from the old one. Something metamorphosizes and a new me comes up. I become stronger after the test. In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, it reads, For when for the first time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, not of strong meat. Your father has a clock. He knows when the time is ripe for you to become a teacher, to graduate from the present level of anointing. Oh, you ought to be desperately hungry for new things. Hungry people do desperate things. I find it a challenge that many believers are not hungry enough. We don't see the move of God because we're not hungry enough. We're not willing to pay the price to usher in the move of God. We must be thirsty for more. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1 says, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, Come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Ye come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. There is something you need to exchange for the anointing. It's not money. It is first desire, 
a longing to abide in His presence where there is boundless joy and pleasure. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. When you abide in the presence of the Lord, His Shekinah glory rests upon you. You step out carrying an anointing to win in life. The anointing is the afterglow, the proof that you have been with God. Wherever the anointing is, there is the manifest power and the presence of God. The anointing is the yoke-destroying and burden-lifting power of God. It is the power of God that makes the difference in the life of the believer. It is the power of God that brings about results in the life of the believer. It is the anointing that opens doors shut against other people. It is the anointing that makes your calling easy. Others look at you and say, how does he cope? But you tell them, I am graced for the job. You've been anointed for a particular throne. You may have been busy chasing assets, but there is a throne waiting for you. Get your mind off those asses. Leave those dumb asses alone. Stop chasing after money and material things. There is a throne waiting for you. Chase after God and seek the kingdom and the asses you are looking for will be found. Samuel told Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 2 that the asses you seek have been found. So you would be at rest to go for the kingdom. By reason of the anointing of God upon your life, there shall be a divine recovery. All that you lost will be recovered. Your joy, peace, honey and money will be found. It is time for your anointing to go to a completely new level from just being born again to being filled with the Holy Ghost and to brimming to overflow with the anointing. In Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1 it reads, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. The rain is the anointing. The anointing is not given to make you feel good. It is not given to give you goosebumps. It comes to produce effects as yokes are destroyed and burdens are lifted. It is a joy to know as believers that you are already anointed because Jesus Christ, the anointed and his anointing, lives within you. He resides within you. You are not asking for something to come down from heaven. It is inside. All you are seeking to do is to learn more and more and to yield yourself to the one who is already at work within you, causing you to will and to do of his own good pleasure. Don't you ever think you are going to look for something outside. It is within you. The anointing is already within you. It takes brokenness and consecration to allow the oil flow out from within you to do the work around you. Ask the Lord to rain upon you until you are soaked and drenched. The people of God will be willing, and in the day they are willing, the power of the Lord will be revealed. When this happens, the church will rule, not amidst friends, not amidst colleagues and supporters who endorse and agree with their destiny. Chapter 6 The Price of Power And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterwards hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command the stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. 
And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. This is in Luke chapter 4 verses 1 to 14. Life is a contest of powers. Everything that happens in life is simply a matter of power. Whether we see in the spiritual dimension or in the physical, life is really lived with a quest for power as the bottom line. We live in the world where the weak are subdued by the strong and the poor are subdued by the rich. These things ought not to be so, but they are the reality of life here on earth. At all levels, it takes power to rule and exercise dominion. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Where the word of a king is, there is power, and who may say unto him, What doest thou? Without adequate power at work in your life as a believer, you will not be able to rule and to dominate here on earth as God has intended for every one of us. We see very clearly that one of the things that Jesus Christ came to do was to restore to man the dominion mandate lost by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they may have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, it says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Here, Jesus wasn't speaking only to the seventy disciples. He was speaking by extension to those who would believe him as those disciples had believed him. Jesus has given you power over the enemy. In other words, I acknowledge that Satan has a measure of power, even though he has fallen right now. Even though certain levels of power have been stripped from him, he still has a measure of power. But I am giving you power that is above whatever power the enemy has, and by no means will he be able to hurt you. Apparently, the power he gave us is a completely different kind from the power he said the devil has. The first word power there in the Greek is exousia, which means delegated authority. When you stand in for someone, you are simply expressing delegated authority. When somebody is sent to represent the president at a function, he speaks as the president. He is honored as the president and addressed as His Excellency, the president, because he was sent on an assignment as the representative of the president. Hence, he is carrying delegated authority from the president. The other power there, referring to the enemy, is dunamis in Greek. And it refers to the power you have within yourself, power you can muster up as strength. Jesus is therefore saying, The power I give you is not dunamis that you can generate and muster up yourself. It is exousia, my power delegated to you. Whenever you show up, in essence, I am the one showing up, and this power will silence the dunamis of the enemy. This is why when you see a skinny policeman or traffic warden lifting a hand before you, you stop. Not because the man is strong enough to stop your vehicle. He couldn't stop you based on his physical strength, but he has the badge of the government of the state. He has the seal or emblem of the police force on his shoulder. So when he lifts his hand, it isn't based on his strength, competence or wealth, but based on the delegated authority of the government he serves. Here then is what Jesus is saying. When you bind the devil, you don't bind the devil based on how long you pray, based on how strong you feel, or based on your position in church. You bind the devil based on the power I have delegated to you. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Why? Because I have sent you as my delegate with my authority, so that when men see you, they don't see you anymore in your capacity, but in my capacity. You now operate in my class. If you studied biology, you would have heard what is called the animal food chain. And the pattern normally is that the bigger animals eat the smaller animals and are themselves eaten by yet bigger animals. So you find that as long as you are small, you are prey and food to the great and mighty. As long as you are weak, you are prey and food to the strong. It appears rather obvious then that the weak live under bondage and at the mercy of the strong. If you are really going to enjoy freedom and dominion as God has mandated, you must make up your mind you are going to be strong in the Lord. Paul charged the saints in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, saying, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You have to make up your mind at some point or the other that enough is enough, enough of going around in circles, enough of seeing the same image, the same picture over and over, enough of sharing the same prayer point, all those prayer points you have shared for months or years, 
over and over again because you know that they are yet to receive answers from God. It's time for those old rusty prayer points to be summarily dealt with. You will fight your way into your liberty. You will fight your way into your freedom. You will fight your way into your dominion. It's time to fight your way into a place where your kingship is no longer just a spiritual position but a living reality expressed all around you. Wherever the word of a king goes, there is power. A desire to experience the tangible manifest power of God must be in your heart. Once again, in this life we live, you seldom get what you desire. You seldom even get what you deserve. More often than not, you get what you fight for. When you purpose in your heart of hearts that you are not going to take things lying down anymore, that change is going to happen in your life and you're going for it, only then will your change come. In Genesis chapter 27 verses 1 to 10, 8 to 19 and 24 to 30, it reads, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his elder son and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, I am here. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore, take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field, and take me some venison, and make me savoury meat, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it, and Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savoury meat, that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock, and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savoury meat for thy father such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And he came unto his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according to as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee. Sit and eat my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near him, and he did eat, and brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near, and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of raiment, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, God, give thee thy dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out of the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his haunting. The story about Isaac's family shows him asking his hunter's son Esau to get him some game to eat and bless the boy before he would die and join his forebearers. Esau actually went hunting in the bush to get the venison. But Jacob, with help from his mother, had prepared the meal desired by the patriarch Isaac. He ate and pronounced definite blessings upon his son Jacob. Esau came back later and wept when he realized his blessing had been stolen. He begged for even a residual blessing anything at all, any tiny blessing, somewhere to hold on to. He cried and pushed, and then his father spoke this word. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. This is in Genesis chapter 27 verse 40. Now, how in the name of all that is good could those words be a blessing? It shall come to pass was the end of serving his brother, what needs to come to pass in your life? What needs to end right now? Now you have exousia, delegated authority from Jesus. You have dominion. It's time to break that yoke from off your neck. Another version renders, when thou shall have dominion, as when you shall come restless. 
Your unrest can arrest the adversary and usher you into true rest. You become restless over being perpetually on the same spot, restless over the same old story, restless over having to offer explanation when manifestation is what is required. It's time to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. You will live far from earth's bounty, remote from heaven's dew. You will live by your sword, hand to mouth, and you will serve your brother. But when you can't take it anymore, you will break loose and run free. This is from Genesis chapter 27 verses 39 to 40, the message translation. You will break free when you become restless and can't take it anymore. Your change begins to happen when you become restless. If some things in your life have been crawling for far too long, if you have carried over too many prayer points for the past few years, if you feel that you have been on the slow lane of life for too long, if you are still asking for money when you ought to be giving money, if you have complained for too long about a particular situation from your past or present, if you have had so many disadvantages in life, if you think you have given too many excuses for not reaching for the glory of your destiny, it is time to engage in spiritual fight for a change. You have got to make up your mind and be prepared to fight for what belongs to you at all costs. You will go up in arms and on the whole armor of God, gird up your loins with truth, cover your head with the helmet of salvation and your heart with the breastplate of righteousness and protect your feet with the gospel of peace. In one hand, hold the shield of faith to withstand the fiery darts of the enemy and with the sword of the spirit in the other hand, advance towards the enemy. You only get what you fight for. Go on and fight for your rightful inheritance. You have explained for too long. It is time to fight for it. In Luke chapter 11 verses 21 to 22, it says, When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. A strong man has to be disarmed by a stronger man for the things that he has held in captivity to be released. No matter how strong the devil may claim to be, we have the understanding from scripture that our God is by far stronger, and so are you. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In Psalm 66, verse 3, it says, Say unto God, How terrible art thou in thy works! Through the greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves unto thee. The 21st century church is designed by God to be a reigning ruling church. The church is designed by God to dominate, to bring bare the full expression of the glory of God here on the earth. She is a church without spot or wrinkle, empowered by God to dislodge Satan and undo all his works. Only through the utilization and expression of the power of God can the church have dominion here on earth. Otherwise, the church will be a storytelling church having a form of godliness without the power of God authenticating their message, as contained in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. God forbid. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, it says, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. God's kingdom is in power. If we are kingdom men and women, the expression of the power of God ought to be our identity. We are a people of power, and we must put the power to work. Paul testified in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 4 to 5, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith shall not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I wasn't just preaching for the sake of preaching, said Paul. I wasn't preaching empty words that would be pleasing and exciting to the ears, but my preaching was in demonstration of the power and the Spirit of God. That power came because he understood the cross. Elsewhere, he said, I bear upon me the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is in Galatians chapter 6, verse 17. Paul always emphasized the preaching of the cross, for the cross is the power of God. Without a demonstration of power by the church, victory and triumph will remain a pipe dream. You have the power, the power to subdue and subject every force from the kingdom of darkness. You have the power to rule to reign and to dominate. You have the power to have it the way the word declares it. You've got the power. Several prophecies in scripture concerning the end time church 
speaks about the dominion of the church. In Psalm 110 verses 1 to 3, it reads, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thy enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The people of God will be willing, and in the day they are willing, the power of the Lord will be revealed. When this happens, the church will rule, not amidst friends, and not amidst colleagues and supporters who endorse and agree with their destiny. God will not allow people to question, Where is your God? God forbid that men will have the occasion to mock you. No matter where you are and what you're going through, there is an end, as stated in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 18. God has far more in store for you than man can perceive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9-10, to it reads, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. These rewards are eternal, but they also show up in the natural, because only here does the Holy Spirit need to reveal anything. That ministry is not needed in heaven, where everything is made plain. Let them watch, let them wait. Your Redeemer lives. He will come through for you. What to do for a change of season? In Matthew chapter 6, you will see three things that believers should do. Almsgiving, prayer and fasting are a threefold cord that cannot be broken. Fasting is not gone with the Old Testament. New Testament saints also fasted. In Acts chapter 13 verses 1 to 3 it reads, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod of Tetrach and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. As you fast and minister to the Lord in prayer, the Holy Ghost will speak. Expect the express voice of God in your days of waiting and watching. Don't get careless with that time. Let it be a time to sharpen your spiritual sensitivity. Let it be a day of focus. Focus begets power. Have you seen when the sun ray go through a magnifying glass and are focused on a piece of paper? The paper catches fire. You have to fix your focus on, I am generating power. It's not your time to run around, make unnecessary calls or visits, sleep on the internet, watch TV and just generally indulge your soul. No, be conscious that you are paying the power bill. All the fun can come later, but now is the time for you to generate power. These are the days of God's power for the church, but it is incumbent upon us to prepare, to optimize and maximize the essence of this season. In Luke chapter 16 verse 16 it reads, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. This is a time for pressing and for applying spiritual pressure. When you press, you are going against your feelings. Your flesh doesn't like it. You deny the flesh its desire so that the spirit can arise and take ascendancy. Fasting doesn't change God. Fasting changes you. You are not getting the attention of God by not eating. Rather, God is getting your attention by taking you away from distractions. There are certain signals your spirit won't pick up until your body is subdued. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 27 that I put my body under. Discipline your body and one easy way to do that is to withdraw food from and the carnal pleasures from it. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What bread is to your body? The word is to your soul. When you feel hungry as you fast, you say, God, fill me. It's you that I need. Fill my hungry heart. Fill my passion. I am waiting and watching, longing just for you. Like David, let your soul pant hard after God. In Psalm 42 verses 1 to 3, it reads, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. 
when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? Pressing is not easy. That's why it's called pressing hard. You press with desire and passion for more of God. We will make a difference on earth if you and I press for the tangible power of God. In Romans chapter 8 verse 19 it reads, For the earnest expectations of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The whole world is waiting for you and me to show forth the glory of the Christ we carry. Christ is in you the hope of glory. The whole world is waiting for this vessel to be broken up, not physically broken, but for itself to give way, so the oil, the anointing in the alabaster box, can be released to God as a sweet-smelling servo. The world is waiting. Where the word of a king is, there is power. God is bringing you to the point where your word will literally become law. As you say it, it comes to pass. The power only comes from consistent engagement with the presence of God, sharing and receiving from Him in a koinonia, that's communion. This is the height of intimacy that makes you share in His thoughts and perceptions. Do you know that even the enemy recognizes it when the power is at work in your life? In Acts chapter 19 verses 13 to 16 it reads, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. The seven sons of Sceva thought they could play Paul, the superman. Let us try to do what he does, they reasoned. But the evil spirit told them, There are people we know about in the spirit world. They knew Jesus. They knew Paul. They will know you as you walk up the ranks. As you come out in the power of the Spirit of God, demons will know your name. Satan knows how to respect power. Light will always command respect in the regions of darkness. John chapter 1 verse 5 says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 13 it says, Then I saw that wisdom excelled folly, as far as light excelled darkness. Whenever light is allowed to shine, darkness can never put up resistance. Every work of the enemy is done in darkness. Sickness, spells, poverty and stagnation are all products of darkness. And what they require to be dealt with is the light of God. The power of God may be likened to the light of God, just like he did when he said, Let there be light, by the word of his power at creation. Light is synonymous with power. If you want the power of God to be expressed in and through you, what you really need to go for is the light of God's word. The brighter you see, the stronger you become, and the more you know, the more you show. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 32 it reads, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. With greater light comes greater release of power, because power, like light, is in degrees. For instance, the amount of power used by a light bulb is decidedly far less than that used by an air conditioner. Therefore, if you are faced with a challenge that has long made mockery of your faith, all you need is more of the light of the word, for the entrance of the word is light, as stated in Psalm 119 verse 130. The light is your door of hope in the valley of trouble. Jesus once told the disciples why they were unable to cast out a certain demon. Matthew chapter 17 verse 21 How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. This text has been misunderstood because we typically interpret it to mean when we face challenges, we need to go and pray and fast. Not quite, because Jesus did not need at that point of challenge to say, Demon, just wait for me, I will show you who's boss, let me go fasting. He was simply saying, If you live this lifestyle of building layer upon layer of power in prayer and fasting, then whenever you encounter this kind, just like me, all you need do is to shake it out. That means when you live your life building spiritual power, 
There ought to be nothing that faces you that you can't deal with on the spot. Besides, he said, this kind, speaking specifically about that demon. So he told them, it is because of your unbelief, that's little faith, you couldn't cast out that demon. So the real issue is not prayer and fasting as much as unbelief. Otherwise, you would be saying there are certain demons that are stronger than God's power, which I need to do something extra to shake out. That will run crosswise to the truth of exousia. Oh, look at the subject of fasting in the following chapter. We have elaborated two truths in so many words. One, whenever you face a great challenge, that challenge is a sign that you need more power. Two, you need to go for that power in prayer and fasting with the word. Whether you like to hear it or not, the power demonstrated in your life is not free. It has to be paid for. If you want the power, you pay for it. There are certain disciplines a people of power engage in to maintain command. They do not just wake up and begin to bind and loose. No. There are certain pleasures they have chosen to deny themselves for the purpose of experiencing power in their lives. Power works by sacrifice. There is simply no shortcut to it. Power works by sacrifice. Let's return to Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1 as we close this chapter. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come and buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. The force of desire. Confusion. Buy without money? How? I thought money was the only means of exchange. We speak of it as purchase and power, but God extends his priceless invitation to everyone that thirsteth, which means thirst, which is desire, hunger and passion, is what we exchange for power. The psalmist captures this in Psalm 63 verses 1 to 8 and reads, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy love and kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened over him and the Father declared with glee, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. As recorded in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. Yet, immediately after being so empowered, he was driven into the wilderness for yet further doses of power. After 40 days of waiting and watching, the Bible says he came out in the power of the Spirit of the living God and his fame spread abroad. May you be blessed indeed by the glory of our God. May every day henceforth bring you fresh revelation of Jesus and take you further in your destiny. May you receive mercy more and more from the throne of grace. May heaven kiss you every day of your life with a fresh anointing. May the word of God become spirit and life to you. May you be strengthened with might by his spirit in your inner man to pay the power bill and become a heavy conductor of the power of God. Chapter 7 God's Chosen Fast In Isaiah chapter 58 verses 5 to 12, it reads, Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to lose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thy own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, 
and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like the watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste place. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. This is perhaps the classic scriptural text on prayer and fasting. Clearly, there is a kind of fast that God has chosen, and there is another kind of fast that men have taken upon themselves. The prophet in this text painstakingly itemized many benefits and blessings that go with the fast that God chooses. I want to be sure you embark on God's chosen fast and not on hunger strike. I say this because I have come to understand that, as Christians in particular and humans in general, there are many things we do only in imitation of others, like copycats with no proper understanding of why people are doing what they are doing. We join the bandwagon blindly and wonder why we are not seeing desired results. Whilst it is recommended that we follow those who are doing right, as stated in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 and chapter 13 verse 7, we still need to seek to have a personal revelation from Scripture for what we do for lasting results. Knowledge and understanding of what we do is what boosts our faith to receive the benefits of what we do and stick it out when we meet speed bumps along the path of obedience. True, God honors obedience, but many times your obedience becomes very profitable when there is revelation behind it. Strong faith is the character of understood instruction. We often learn first by imitation. Imitation is the first rung on the ladder of learning, they say. But then, we must step on into the higher realm to maximize our learning by personal revelation and deep understanding. The level of learning is very limited for a Christian, as long as all we do is imitate what other believers do based on their persuasion and understanding. It is crucial to have personal understanding for fruitfulness to characterize our walk of faith. Look at the parable of the sower. It seems understanding the parable of the sower is key to unlocking every other parable in scripture because in Mark chapter 4 verse 13, Jesus wonders how we would understand other parables if we miss this one. In Mark chapter 4 verses 3 to 13, it reads, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, and some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And others fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were with him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all things are done in parables. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? Other grounds had their seeds stolen, devoured, or choked to death. But there was a particular ground, good ground, whose seed yielded fruit at three levels, thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. The factor that made the good ground different is understanding born out of meditation. It was only the good ground that retained the seed and nothing from within or without touched the seed. The word must have no competition for your heart to be good ground. We must always seek understanding from the word above anything else. Prayer and fasting cannot be maximized without understanding. In Acts chapter 8 verses 27 to 31, it reads, And he arose and went, and behold a man of Ethiopia, 
an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. From time to time, God will send men to unveil certain truths to you, so you can maximize and benefit from them. I believe you must have at one time or the other embarked on a fast, whether it was a fast specially instructed for you by the Spirit of God as an individual or a fast undertaken in corporate worship by your pastor. You simply obeyed and benefited. You were blessed to some measure because you obeyed the instruction of God as you knew it. Perhaps you got a 30-fold or even 60-fold measure of increase, but I believe that with an increase in light, that is understanding, you will be able to rise to a hundredfold return on investment. In John chapter 8 verse 32 it reads, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In Psalm 119 verses 130 it says, The entrance of thy word giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. The difference in result between two believers is not height, gender or color, but their levels of understanding. At every cost, you must strive to gain understanding of the truth contained in the word. Freedom comes at the point of understanding, according to John chapter 8, verse 32. Reading and hearing the word of God are good, but you must read and read and hear and hear to the point of understanding. The eyes that look are many, but the eyes that see are few. Too many times, we read just too little. We don't read and study until light shines into our lives and shatters every iota of darkness. We may hear here a little, there a little, but just not enough to allow the light of the Word of God, but not just enough to allow the light of the Word of God penetrate deep within us. The key is to read and hear until the light of God shines. Then we will experience liberty. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Hearing once is not enough. Hearing once brings a measure of faith. When we hear again, we hit another dimension of faith. Whenever you are in church listening to a message, your focus must not be on getting excited, entertained, motivated or encouraged. While these are by themselves qualities of a very good message, your real desire should be to understand what the Spirit is saying. Because if you can understand what is being said, the devil cannot steal the seed that is sown in your heart it will develop deep roots and bear much fruit. Now let us set out to understand why we fast and what fasting is in the first place. I really believe that we will be able to enjoy the full benefits of fasting when we have studied what God's Word says about it. What is fasting? Definitions vary, but generally, fasting is a voluntary and deliberate abstinence from food and or water for the purpose of concentrated prayer. Fasting is a biblical principle that runs through the Old and New Testaments. It holds true to the New Testament as much as it does in the Old Testament. As we survey scripture from Genesis to Revelation, we find that the scriptures have so much to teach, both by example and by precept, on the value of fasting. Some of the great men used significantly by God to shape lives, to literally mold destinies, were men who were given to a consistent lifestyle of prayer and fasting. For instance, Moses, the lawgiver, David the king, Elijah the prophet, even Daniel the seer. In the New Testament, we have the Lord Jesus Christ who embarked on a 40-day fast. We also see the apostles, after his ascension, take on this lethal combination of fasting and prayer weaponry. They prayed regularly, but they also added fasting to their prayer. Thus, we know that fasting clearly has an integral part in the life of a New Testament church. Three forms of fasting. One, the normal fast. This is fasting that involves abstinence from all foods, whether in liquid or solid form, but not from water. It seems quite evident from scripture that this was the kind of fast that Jesus embarked upon for 40 days and 40 nights. How do we know that? In Matthew chapter 4 verse 2 it says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. He fasted and he became hungry, but the scripture never said he was thirsty. He was hungry, but not thirsty. 
In Luke chapter 4 verse 2 it says, Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, but when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Here again we see Luke the physician clearly mentioned Jesus ate nothing and was hungry. He was not thirsty. It seems more than probable then that he drank something. He afterward hungered means he turned his plate over, as it were, from eating food for forty days and forty nights, but he allowed himself to drink water. This is the normal general fast. When we speak about the word fasting generally, we typically mean a moment of abstinence from food, but not from water. 2. The Absolute Fast This fast involves total abstinence from food and water. There are examples in the scripture that relate to this particular fast. In Acts chapter 9 verses 8 to 9, it says, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. This great apostle, revered by generations gone and generations to come, was inaugurated into the ministry with the season of fasting. This was an absolute fast. He neither ate nor drank anything. In Ezra chapter 10 verse 6, it reads, Then Ezra rose up before the house of God, and went into the chamber of Jonathan the son of Eliashib. And when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgressions of them that had been carried away. In Esther chapter 4 verse 16, it reads, Go, gather all the Jews that are present in Shosan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. We see that the absolute fast is a fast that we perhaps embark upon when there is a desperate situation. It is said that desperate situations require desperate measures. Notwithstanding, it is not recommended except with a very clear instruction from God. Additionally, absolute fasting should not be longer than three days except you hear the Lord lead you clearly to do so. 3. The Partial Fast this one deals with restriction of diet more than it deals with abstinence from food. It is the kind of fast that Daniel embarked upon. In Daniel chapter 10 verse 3 it reads, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. He ate no pleasant food for twenty-one days. You know the story in the book of Daniel chapter 1 where these Hebrew boys brought into Babylon were supposed to be made to eat the sumptuous meals that came from the king's table, many of which were first of all dedicated to Babylonian gods. So Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah said to the king's steward, Wait a minute, we have purposed in our hearts that we will not defile ourselves. Let us eat vegetables for the next ten days to prove to you that we will be fresher than our pears eating the sumptuous meals from the table of the king. They were allowed for 10 days to experiment, and they were found to be better and fresher than others who partook of the king's menu. What Daniel and his friends embarked on in that season is a partial fast. In other words, you haven't stopped eating completely, you haven't stopped drinking completely, but you have simply stopped eating and drinking things that you know are pleasurable. However, whenever we talk about fasting, by and large, our focus is on the normal fasting except otherwise indicated by whoever calls for the fast. Now let us examine some certain statements made by Jesus about fasting. In Matthew chapter 6 verses 2, 5 and 16, it reads, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. In these three verses of one chapter, we find Jesus make reference to giving, praying, and to fasting. One key word in all these three verses is when. Not if, but when. 
That means there will suddenly come a point in time that as a believer you will exercise yourself in giving, in praying and in fasting. In like manner, as you pray regularly and consistently, you are expected to give consistently and regularly and also fast regularly and consistently. There is another chapter in which Jesus made reference to fasting. This is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, which reads, And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall ye fast. Here, Jesus was chided by the Pharisees for his disciples' lack of fasting. He said, As long as I am here with them as bridegroom, they will have no need to fast. But when the bridegroom has departed, they will need to fast. That was a most prophetic statement by Jesus. He was saying, The time to fast is not when I am with you physically, but when I am taken, between my going away and my second coming is the period that the church is to fast. So why we believe in the New Testament, enjoying the several benefits and blessings of being covenant children of the covenant God, we are not exempt from this practice of fasting. There is so much God has put behind this weaponry for us to benefit from here on earth before the Messiah returns. Notwithstanding, as New Testament believers, we don't fast like the Pharisees fasted. We don't fast like the disciples or John the Baptist fasted. We don't fast to mourn Jesus. We fast because there's power embedded in it and released for us between now and his return. Jesus' prophetic word in Matthew chapter 9, verse 15 is being fulfilled. The bridegroom has been taken away and the time has come that the church has to fast. If you read through the New Testament, especially Acts of the Apostles, you will find that the early church was given to regular fasting and prayer. It was a regular practice for believers in that day and generation. I believe it was one factor that released upon them apostolic power that brought about the signs and wonders we read about in Acts of the Apostles. In this generation, if we want to experience the self-same power that we read about in Acts of the Apostles, we can't subscribe to some of the apostolic practices and do without the rest. We must seek to know what the apostles did what was their practice, and seek to do every one of those practices that we may enjoy the full benefits. I mentioned earlier on that the fast can be divinely instructed for a person individually led by the Spirit of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit can lead an individual into a fast for a season, for a duration of time. But there is also the corporate fast that can be called upon by the set man, that's the pastor or eldership of a local assembly, for that particular local assembly or as in Bible days, by the king of the nation for that particular nation. Whenever God calls for a corporate fast and the people obey to go into the corporate fast, there is something God intends to do through those seasons and through those moments. And when they believe and obey, the benefits accrue to them accordingly. With every fast we embark upon, the aim and objective will ultimately be to glorify God by making the fast unto him and not unto ourselves. When we fast, we are to do so with great sincerity and humility of heart and willingness to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of the Lord, that he will in turn exalt us. God responds to such level of sincerity. Many times we quickly ask ourselves, what am I to gain out of this fast? While I can enumerate several benefits of fasting and waiting upon the Lord when it is properly done, our first question ought to be, how am I going to use this season to honor and give glory to my God? And having made that point, let me quickly give you four reasons why you should fast because it is easier for us to do it when we know the reasons for it. Reasons for fasting 1. It is in obedience to scripture. Fasting is a commandment in scripture. Therefore, when we fast, we are obeying the scriptures commanded by God. It is an act of honor and reverence for God. 2. It reinforces the weaponry of prayer. Matthew chapter 17 verse 21 tells us that every now and then you bump into some challenge best described as this kind. You've done all you know how to do but somehow this mountain refuses to move. God says the solution for this kind of trouble is prayer coupled with fasting. When we do fast for the purpose of concentrated prayer, please pray. Fasting gives bite to the punch of prayer but fasting by itself is useless without prayer. The way I see the dual combination of prayer and fasting is like a bow and arrow. The bow you pull back is fasting, but the arrow is prayer. You need the combination of the bow and arrow for the arrow to travel a long distance and make full impact. Yes, somebody can take the arrow with his hand and throw, 
and it will go some distance, but not go all the distance. But if you put the same arrow in a bow and shoot, suddenly that arrow travels a much further distance than it did before. Why? Reinforcement. It must be stressed that the bow itself is not of much use without the arrow. In like manner, it is going on hunger strike when you cease from eating, but you don't combine your season of waiting and watching with keenness of ear to hear the voice of God in prayer. Fasting must have prayer with it to account for something that brings the hundredfold increase. 3. Fasting overcomes unbelief and doubt. Believe it or not, fasting overcomes unbelief and doubt. In the text in Matthew 17, where Jesus said, This kind goeth not out except by prayer and fasting. The first thing he said to them as the reason they were not able to cast out the devil was their unbelief. It is true, this kind can be referred to as a particular situation. But when you look at the context of that scripture, you'll also find, like some theologians have pointed out, that this kind was a reference to the subject matter of doubt. That means there are certain kinds of doubt that would not move except they were hit with the combination of prayer and fasting. Fasting humbles and subdues the flesh. For your spirit to rise in the place of keenness and sensitivity, your flesh needs to be subdued and we use fasting to humble our flesh. In Psalm 35 verse 13 it reads, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. Also in Psalm 109 verse 24 it reads, My knees are weak through fasting and my flesh faileth of fatness. Fasting is a moment to humble your flesh and when your flesh is ever humbled, what happens is that your spirit automatically gains ascendancy and operates at a higher frequency. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. There is an ongoing war between your spirit man and your flesh, and your soul stands as umpire or judge between them to decide who wins. The Holy Bible says we are either carnally minded, when the soul is leaning towards the flesh, or spiritually minded, when the soul is leaning towards the spirit. Whichever the soul leans to, gains victory. So when we fast, we humble and weaken the flesh to give the spirit the leverage to gain victory. 5. Fasting reminds us of our dependence on God. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, it reads, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. There is a dimension of your life's existence that is dependent on bread, and there is another dimension that is not dependent on bread, but on the word of God. When we fast and do without food or water, we tell our body that our life is primarily dependent on God and not on food. Although in that moment of fasting your flesh complains and cries, you are teaching your flesh a lesson that I can live without food, but I can't live without God. 6. Fasting creates an atmosphere of spiritual sensitivity. Heightened spiritual sensitivity and alertness happens when we fast. In other words, fasting sharpens your spiritual discernment. It sharpens your keenness. In Acts chapter 13 verses 2 to 3, it reads, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, they sent them away. In the place of fasting and prayer, the apostles were sensitive to hear what the Holy Spirit was saying. As you are upon the mountain top, as you are upon the rampart, as you are upon the lighthouse of fasting and prayer, always have with you a notepad and a pen. Have a tape recorder, if you can, so that in the middle of your day, while on the job or something else, and the Spirit of the living God brings upon you certain things He will have you say or do, you quickly document what the Holy Ghost is saying to you. The reason is that it takes one idea for you to rock your world. With your heightened sensitivity, you will be able to hear more clearly the small, still voice of the living God. 7. Fasting builds spiritual stamina. Spiritual stamina built up by prayer and fasting breaks off spiritual wickedness and bondage. When you pray fasting, just like a man who is on a treadmill or a man in the gym, you are building up your spiritual stamina. Jude chapter 1 verse 20 says, But ye, beloved, 
building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. As you combine waiting and watching to your prayer, you are building up spiritual stamina. There will come a point in future time that situations will place a demand on the stamina within you. You can only respond with what you have. When you don't have it, nothing will be there to respond with. No wonder the Bible says, if you faint in the day of adversity, it is proof positive that your strength is little. This is in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10. Build up spiritual stamina by prayer and fasting. 8. Fasting restores health. Medical practitioners and nutritionists will tell you about the several benefits of fasting. In fact, medical science recommends that within a week, you shall spend a period of 24 hours at least fasting. It has nothing to do with spirituality, just medicine and healthy living standards. That action once a week is able to help you clear away toxins and all kinds of free radicals running around your body. You give your organs a season to rest and recuperate. In Isaiah chapter 58 verse 8, it reads, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. 9. Fasting releases power to break the spirit of delay. Prayer will break the spirit of delay, but when we combine it with fasting, it reinforces the strength of prayer to break the spirit of delay. In simple words, fasting will bring you from the slow lane to the fast lane. Fasting combined adequately with prayer causes divine acceleration. 10. Fasting builds spiritual capacity. When you are about to embark on a crusade and you spend adequate time in the place of prayer and fasting, it heightens the healing anointing. It adds to it. It multiplies the measure of grace on your life. Whatever grace is on your life, prayer and fasting multiplies it many times over. 11. Fasting shape and remold history and destinies. If you go through scriptures, you will see how men and women use the weaponry of prayer and fasting to literally change the direction of the clock of history over a nation and a people. Fasting can be used to reshape the history and destiny of persons, peoples, cities and nations. Queen Esther asked the children of Israel to embark on fasting and prayer. And by that prayer, God changed the fortunes of the children of Israel in Shushan. 12. Fasting renews spiritual strength. Health is one thing, but strength is another. And in the place of fasting, our strength is renewed. In Isaiah chapter 40 verses 30 to 31, it reads, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. 13. Fasting compels our service and worship to God. Fasting complements and adds to our service. It is an act of worship as we are making our bodies a living sacrifice for God's purpose. This is in Romans chapter 12 verse 2. In Luke chapter 2 verse 37 it reads, And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. We serve God in the place of fasting and prayer. It adds color to our service and completion of worship. 14. Fasting turns our hearts to God. In Joel chapter 2 verses 12 to 13, it reads, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Sometimes we are rending our garments, but need to add fasting to our prayer in order to get to the heart that our repentance may be true and qualitative and sincere. 15. Fasting is a way to seek God with stronger determination. In Daniel chapter 9 verse 3 it says, And I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Also in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verse 3 it reads, and Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. In Ezra chapter 8 verse 21, it says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God, 
to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. Not just prayer, but with fasting, sackcloth and ashes, which may be seen as our feeling of discomfort today. Fasting isn't a time to be comfortable because seeking God is serious business. You must lose yourself in it. In Isaiah chapter 58 verse 6 it reads, Is not this the first that I have chosen? To lose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye might break every yoke. That means when we fast as God prescribed, every band of wickedness in and around our lives will be loosed. He said fasting will also undo heavy burdens and cause the oppressed, those who are bound, who are in captivity, to go free. So if there is any form of captivity and bondage in your life, God says you can break free in the place of fasting and prayer. He says that he will cause every yoke to be broken. In Isaiah chapter 58 verse 8, it says, Then thy light shall break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. In the season of watching, in praying and fasting, God stares within you fresh revelation and new understanding. As you dig into your Bible, every scale that hitherto sealed your eyes will fall off. The word of God will become more alive than ever before. The veil will not be torn apart. You will be changed from glory to glory, speedily with strength and without delay. Your breakthrough won't be gradual. It will literally be a breaking through. What has been disturbing you for so long? Watch out, because when God brings solutions to situations, He will step in suddenly, speedily and forcefully. Don't expect a gradual change. Expect a sudden change. Expect a speedy change. Expect that your light will break forth and your health will spring forth speedily. In the areas you have labored to live right, the righteousness of God is going to precede you. There will be grace to walk right. God says, in this season, I will give you the grace to walk out on sin. As you sincerely with all your heart seek my face, I am going to so empower you. You are going to detest the sins that you once loved. You will see the things that once lured you and you will hate them. You will love righteousness and hate wickedness. Why? Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Glory is about to be released over your life to cause you to shine like the midday sun. Isaiah chapter 58 verses 9 to 10 reads, Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness as the noonday. Sweet answers are coming. Revelation knowledge is moving you from obscurity into the spotlight. What was dark in your life is about to be as bright as the light as the noonday. Can you imagine your darkness becoming so bright, as bright as the sun? The sun of righteousness is rising upon you with healing in his wings. As it states in Malachi chapter 4 verses 2 to 3, it will be like a dream when you see your turnaround. You will rejoice. Psalm 126 says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord had done great things for them. The Lord had done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. This is in Psalm 126. In Isaiah chapter 58 verse 11 it says, And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Expect divine direction. Expect divine guidance as a sheep of his pasture. The text is about God's chosen fast and God's promises that when you embark on this kind of fast, certain things happen, one of which is that he will satisfy you in the time of drought. He says he will make your bones fat, and you shall be watered like a garden, like a spring of water, and your water shall never fail. In other words, God is about to connect you to a source that will never fail. You will just stay fresh and evergreen because your source will never be diminished. Elijah ate from ravens, from a widow and from angels. 
He ate angel's food and went 40 days and 40 nights on a journey, and he never got tired. Expect a meal from God this season that will infuse strength to run the course of your next phase of your destiny and calling. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 12 says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste place. Thou shalt rise upon the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. God is saying, I don't just have the recovery, reparation and restoration mantle over your life. I am also going to make you an instrument of restoration unto others. You are going to be so healed by God that he will make you a healer. You are going to be so economically empowered by God that he will make you a sucker unto others. God will not only recover things that are lost in your life, but will also make you an epitome of restoration. He is about to make you a tool in his hands to repair damaged lives. As you await your miracle, rejoice. The book of Philippians chapter 4 verses 4 to 8 reads, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, for in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. The End The book, Paying the Power Bill, Walking in the Anointing, was authored by Apostle Goodhart Obi Akweme and narrated and produced by Onimisi Adaba for 123 Communications Limited. Thank you for listening. Apostle Goodhart, as he's fondly known, serves as the apostolic lead of Horn of Revival Ministry Horn, a global outreach ministry with the mandate to carry the torch of revival across nations. He is also the lead pastor of Revival House of Glory International Church, Rogic, the church expression of Horn, a fast-growing prophetic church with headquarters in Abuja, Nigeria. He is a prolific writer with over 30 books, including the classic titles, Revival is Here Again, Catch the Fire, and Living in the Father's Love Zone. Apostle Goodhart is a mentor to many and a well-traveled, astute teacher of God's Word. Passionate about raising a new generation of leaders, he hosts two outreach programs, Bethel Ministers and Leaders Conferences, BEMIL, and Winning Today on Campus, which in over a decade has positively affected several thousands of ministers, leaders, professionals, and young people for the Lord. He is the host of the weekly insightful and inspirational radio program, Winning Today, and the television broadcast, Revival is Here Again, with Pastor Goodhart. He hosts the wave-making online Global Prophetic Prayer Altar, GPPA, which airs on www.rogic.radio.org and other media platforms. He is happily married to Pastor Abimbola Ekweme, his life partner and best friend, and they are blessed with three lovely sons and a beautiful daughter. Thank you again for listening. You can contact us at www.rogic.org or on all our social media platforms at Apostle Goodhart.